it, it, it's everybody seeing that since uh, looks yes okay. yes perfect we can see very clearly so i will shortly uh, uh, introduce you so hello everybody good morning uh, good afternoon good evening it's uh, our honor and the great pleasure to have uh, two distinguished uh, speakers from uh, Brazil. So our first speaker is Professor uh, Zuma Maya. He's a professor of neurotology and a very big name in the vestibular field. He's known for his uh, maneuver for uh, geotropic and apogeotropic horizontal canal. Uh, he works in uh, Albert Einstein uh, University in Brazil. And he's uh, doing a lot of clinical and research work. And he has a very nice book in neuroautology. And I think most of the audience, they know very well Professor Zuma. And uh, Dr. Renato Kell is a neuroautologist trained in ENTs. And he did a fellowship for three years at Harvard University in the United uh, States with Professor uh, Stephen Roche. Uh, he's uh, passionate of the vestibular system and he's uh, doing a great work uh, clinical and uh, on research wise. He has a lot of publications and a lot of instances uh, in the vestibular field. So it's our honor to uh, welcome uh, those uh, top um, uh, guest speakers. It's uh, really an honor and a great uh, pleasure for us. Uh, I please, I request all the audience to turn off their uh, mics so we have a better quality for connections and uh, uh, for um, uh, flow of the uh, program. Uh, and please, we'll start with uh, Dr. Uh, Renato Kell. So please uh, take off. Okay, Professor Alfangal Mohammed, thank you very much for your kind invitation. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, I also would like to thank you, my colleagues, that we have 116 person right now. And I'm, I'm, you know, I have been Middle East for a couple times. I have been in India and United Arab Emirates and Qatar for a couple times. And I had many friends, so I'd like to welcome everybody to join us. And we are, we, we are going to present this, this morning here in Brazil, we're going to present a um, uh, kind of general talk of BBPV and focus a little bit more in lateral canal because we believe that this is what most part of your, our audience wants to, you know, questioning. So um, we're going to start the, this presentation and um, I have a few disclosures here. I work as a speaker in, for a few pharmaceutical companies and for some international companies of vestibular products, but they, you know, this commercial related is absolutely not related with this talk. So this is my, my disclosure. And before I start, I'd like to do an acknowledge. I, I just learned in my life that we should be grateful for everybody who teach us. And these three persons here, Professor Zuma, Professor Mangabeira, and Bernardo, those are my friends, those are my research fellows, those are my colleagues, and I do would like I, I owe I owe them so much, and I'd like to thank you for all of three guys who makes my life very better because they work with us. So when we talk about BPPV, I have a quotation that I use for from Professor Perez in Spain. The Professor Perez, he is a very well-known professor, and he used it to say that the easiest patients with the easy patients, the easiest ones are the BPPV ones. But the point is, uh, some of them are also the most difficult ones. Uh, I, I just like to talk about BPPV because I believe everybody have an experience. So all of us, all of you guys, you have something to add about BPPV because you have experience. And this is very true because most of us, we have like very easy cases and we just solve the cases and the patient's pretty much happy. But sometimes we have to struggle with very difficult patients, and especially lateral canal or post-trauma BPPVs. And this is a very true sentence, that the easiest patients are BPPV, but also the most difficult ones. And I want to do a disclosure right here. And 
All my talk is regarding BPPV. I'm not talking about position on nystagmus itself. I know that many of you guys knows that a lot of positional nystagmus, they are not related to BPPV. We have cerebellar problems, especially related to the nodulus, which is sensitive to gravity. And we know that a lot of central pathology can cause positional nystagmus, including migraine. But my talk is not regarding to positional nystagmus. We are talking about BPPV itself, okay? So during this coronavirus pandemic, we are, you know, we have been spending many times in online education and I just read this paper a few months ago and this paper was very interesting to me. It's from a group in Turkey and they just published what the otolaryngologists want to learn. I mean, what is the educational targets? And for my surprise, most of the, the otolaryngologists, especially in the research hospitals, in state hospitals, otology and neurotology is also the first or the second most desirable targets of knowledge. Uh, and it tells us a little stuff because we just can imagine that most, of, most part of our fellows otolaryngologists, they want to learn more about the vestibular pathology. And that's great. I think that this shows us how interesting is this, you know, is this topic coming for our attention. And in this my presentation, uh, we have three goals, right? The first goal is understanding a little bit about BPPV pathophysiology. The second one is trying to correctly diagnose BPPV and we're gonna discuss the treatment options. So let's go through for understanding the pathophysiology. And when we talk about BPPV, we know that BPPV means benign paroxysmal position of vertigo. And one of the good things, it's the most common vestibulopathy and doesn't really matter where you live. I mean, if you live in Asia or if you live in America or in Europe, it doesn't really matter. BPPV is the most common cause of peripheral vertigo periods, right? And even though if you work in a tertiary referral center, you will still see a lot of BPPV patients. So it's the most common vestibular pathology, but also it's a condition that it is 100% treatable. And that's good. Can, can you imagine a very common disease and we have chances to treat this disease in a very effective way? It's a very good thing. So I really like BPPV for that. And the symptoms of BPPV, it's pretty much straightforward, which means uh, we do not have troubles to diagnose BPPV. I mean, diagnose BPPV, it's easy. But the question is, BPPV is a really benign condition, you know, for a medical point of view, it is benign. I mean, nobody goes, nobody dies for BPPV, but uh, this really B here, which means benign, for the patient prospect, sometimes it's not benign because it can cause frustration, it can cause fear, it can cause anxiety, sometimes even depression. Sometimes the patient becomes depressed for having BPPV so many times. And considering that, uh, it's a condition that we have to deal in a very serious way, even though it's not medical dangerous, right? And there's a couple of theories to explain uh, the pathophysiology of BPPV, and I'm quite sure all of you guys are very familiar with this theories, which is the cupulo lattice that he's been described by Professor Shuknak back in 69, and the theory of ductal lattice that he's been described by, you know, a group of professors, Hal, Rabbi, and McClure back in 79. And even though these theories, they have been described, you know, many years ago, there are a lot of things that we still don't know about that. And to thinking about the crystals are free floating or attached to the cupola, it's a very simplistic way to think about the PPV. Um, I, uh, this picture that I'm showing to you, it's that those pictures are the original ones. The, the, this is the autopathology thing. So you can see here, it's the autopathology of the posterior canal. Here we see the cupola of the, the posterior canal and see the, the cupola here in the crystal. And you see some autoconia, some you know, minor crystals attached to the cupola. And those images, it's a, uh, is the original ones that Professor Shuknak saw uh, in microscope and he described the cupulolatias theory. 
Those pictures were gifted from one of my professors, Professor Summer Merchant, who was a you know, marvelous person. He unfortunately passed away a few years ago, but he, his work is still pretty much alive and that really motivates everybody to read his publications because he was such a great researcher. And this is the, 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 the basis for the cupola lattice theory. And those pictures are courtesy from Professor Parnes. And in Professor Parnes, he was, you know, uh, performing um, temporal bone surgery. And when he opened the lateral canal and uh, drilling, he just saw uh, some free floating particles moving around and he was documenting the, the you know, the ductual lattice theory. And this is a very good paper and I motivate everybody to read that. It's, um, you know, to, to think that the particles are just free floating, it's a very simplistic hypothesis. I mean, the, the real life is a little bit more complicated than that. You know, this paper that just show us that when we think about crystal, we are not talking about one crystal or two crystals or three crystals moving around. We are talking about a mass of autoconis. And sometimes this mass of autoconis comes with some small fragments of the utricular membrane itself. So it's, it, there's not just crystals, not just the autoconias, you know, moving around. It's like a big mass of autoconias and utricular membrane fragments. And that's why it makes the, the, some case of PPPV different than others, because to think about that just one stone, it, it's a very simplistic hypothesis. It doesn't work like that. So when we think about this couple of theories, which is canalatized and cupulatized, what give us support for that? How can we be quite sure that it really exists? You know, there's a few, there's a few, uh, there's a few explanations for that. First of all, is that the patient responds positively way for the repositional test. So give us um, confidence that we are really treating the disease. And we do have some animal models for BPPV, which is also great. And we do have some studies uh, studying the OVAMP, the ocular vestibular revoked myogenic potential, which tests the utricular functions. And we just saw that patients with BPPV have some alterations in, in the tune of the OVAMP and it has given support that these patients have really a uh, utricular pathology. And there's many, many, many models of mathematical analysis of BPPV. And all this information gives us support that these theories of canalatized and cupulatized really exist. Uh, I have a question, and I want everybody to see these videos and think about that. You know, first video, it's a regular case of right side posterior canal BPP. Pay attention to that. We're gonna do a Dix Halpike test. And you are seeing a patient with you know torsional right beating nystagmus. So it's a common one. Okay. Pay attention in the intensity of nystagmus. Pay attention. It's a, it's a medium intensity, right? And we can see that it's a medium intensity. So let's see the other video. The other video is another patient with posterior canal BPPV right side. Just uh, Dr. Slightly. Renato, we didn't see the video. It, it's, it wasn't, the eye is not moving. Uh, sorry for that. In, in my screen, shows like it was working. I, 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 I'm going to go again for the slide, okay? I'm going to move back okay. here. Thank you. Maybe, maybe it's the internet connection. I don't know. Let me, let me come back a little bit. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do again the first video. It's a regular BPPV patient, right? Are you seeing that right now? No, still, still same. Just to try the other videos. If finally, we, we can try playing from your uh, Desktop, not uh, not the PowerPoint. Yeah, we we yeah, can so try this. Yeah. yeah, I believe it, I believe it's the. Uh, I think the audience is telling it works. Maybe for me only. Okay, so, so it's fine. First video, it's it's a normal video. It's a normal uh, posterior canal BPPV 
with the nystagmus in a medium intensity, which means not so intense and not so slow. It's a medium intensity. The second video here, Dao, it's a kind of very intense in nystagmus. You're gonna see that. The patient, we're gonna do in a Dixal pipe test and the eyes is gonna jump around and move it so fast. So pay attention to that. So the eyes are moving very, very, very fast. It's a, it's a very intense, high intensity nystagmus, right? And in this third video here, it's a patient with a very, very mild posterior canal BPPV, which means the nystagmus is very, very, very mild. And I have a question for you. Um, all these three patients, look at that, the nystagmus look, looks very mild. So I have a question for you. Those three patients, it's posterior canal BPPV right side. Why one patient have a very intense nystagmus, other patients very medium intensity, and another one have very low intensity? What, what's the explanation for that? I mean, this is one of the questions that I was asking myself all the time. Why BPPV patients, they just behavior, I mean, the nystagmus behavior in a different way, right? Mm -hmm. And to answer these questions, we have to remember that we are talking about a biomechanical disease. It's, it's, it's a very important to remember that BPPV, it's not a neurological disease. It's not a disease that comes with neural influence. It's a pretty much biomechanical disease. So when we understand this biomechanical principle, we can, we can start to understand many things about BPPV. And BPPV is actually what we call the rolling stones. I mean, the stones are free floating and they are rolling around and we have to figure that out where the stones are. And imagine that you have a stone like this big in, in, in your hands. And you have another stone like this big. You know, those stones look like the same? Of course not. And imagine that we throw this stone in a lake. What kind of difference are you gonna see? Many difference, right? A small stone, you're gonna have some small waves. In a big stone, you're gonna have such big waves in the, in the lake. And that's exactly what happened in our patients with BPPV. So uh, imagine that you have buckets full of water and you just drop a two different stones, a big one and a small one. You know, the velocity is gonna be different. The displacement of the water is gonna be different and the and if we just think about the posterior canal or the semicircular canals, remember that you have the cupola and you have endolymph. So if you have a big movement of the endolymph, your cupola will displace it so much and it will trigger a high descent. If you have a very mild you know, movement of the cupola, you have a mild descent. So this is a paper that uh, it's not a brand new one. It has been published more than 15 years ago but I strongly recommend everybody to read that. Uh, it's a paper that has been published not in a medical journal, actually it was published in an engineer, in a biomechanical engineer journal, and it was published by a guy named Richard Rabbit. Richard Rabbit is a professor of bioengineer in the Utah University in the United States, and this guy is pretty much brilliant because he has interesting ideas about BPPV. And this paper show us uh, many things that we're supposed to learn about the difference between latency and magnitude of the nystagmus. Mm -hmm. So they did an experimental. Pay attention in this video. This video is a courtesy from Professor Rabbit. Look at that. This is a regular dix pike maneuver. So you put the patient in the first position, the otoconia is moving that, you have a displacement of the endolymph and the cupola, the otoconia becomes, you know, stopping, and then the, the cupola comes for a normal position. You move the patient up again, and the cupola moves. So let's pay attention here in this graph. Uh, in this X, you have time, in this X, you have the cupola, volume displacement. So when we think about dix pike test, you have a latency, which means you lay down the patient and when you are laying down the cupola displacement because you're moving the head, when you stop the head, the cupola comes back to the normal position and the autoconius moves so the cupola displaces again and you have what we call the latency. Then you have what we call the intensity of nystagmus, which is 
regular directional to the cupola displacement. If you have a very big displacement, the nystagmus will be intense. If you have a very small one, the nystagmus is going to be a small intensity. So you have here the intensity, and here is the duration of the nystagmus. It's actually the time that your cupola comes back to the neutral position. And that's the mechanical and mathematical explanation for dixie hall pipe test. So, Professor Rabbit, he did an experimental. He took different size of particles, a single particle with 7.5 nanometers and 18 nanometers, which is different size. And they saw the impact in the cupola of different size. So pay attention there. The big particle, the big stone, it have a very short latency, short, very short latency with, with a big cupola displacement, right? And the nystagmus have a small duration. When you think about a small stone, you have a big latency with a very small cupola displacement and the nystagmus was more, have a bigger duration. That's the explanation for our patients. And we published that. We published that back in 2016, our group, we just demonstrate that the patients who have the bigger latency of the nystagmus, the intensity was smaller. So it's a kind of support for this biomechanical theory. I really uh, recommend that everybody to read this paper because it was pretty much significant, this relation between latency and this, the intensity of the nystagmus. Uh, this is another patient, right? This is another patient. Pay, pay attention to this patient because we, we're going to discuss what's going on. Uh, I'm going to perform a dix pipe test, I mean, regular one. Pay attention in the latency of the nystagmus. I hope your video is, is working. So I'm moving the head to the right. I'm laying down the patient. Look at that. See the, see the, the clock here. You know, the, the eyes is pretty much, you know, stationary. Then stationary, it's been 11 seconds, it's okay. When you reach 14 seconds, the nystagmus starts, right? And very, very, very tiny nystagmus. So if I think about what's going on in this patient, this patient have a big stone or a small stone? Probably it's a small stone. And, and why is that? Because the latency was big and the intensity of the nystagmus was smaller. And you can ask me, so what is the importance of that? It has some kind of implication when you perform the airplane maneuver. Because if you think about that, a small stone moves slowly, you have to wait more time in each position of the airplane maneuver. If you think about that, the big stone moves fast, you can be a little bit more faster in the airplane maneuver. So it's the principles of the biomechanical disease. And another thing that the, the biomechanic concept explain uh, some aspects of the BPPB is the concept of the fatigability. Fatigability, it's a, it's a thing that many people do not understand. So when you talk about for BPPV with a first year resident, you can tell them that when you perform a dix hop like the patient has nystagmus, and if you repeat the maneuver, the patient do not have nystagmus. And you say, well, it, it fatigues. And I remember the first time I, 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 I saw that, I, I, I didn't know what's going on and I asked someone and someone told me, well, there's a neuro adaptation in a repeated dix hall pipe test. And I was thinking about that and said, well, I didn't buy that. I didn't buy that because neuro adaptation takes time. So you cannot be adapted so fast. And to explain that in these biomechanical principles, uh, there's a paper that also has been published in the biomechanical journal, not medical journal, by a doctor in Switzerland, Dominico Brist. He is a very brilliant research. And he published this paper showing us that there's no neural adaptation in BPPV. What is going on is the biomechanical concept. The fatigability of the nystagmus is related to the fluid dynamics rather than neural mechanism. And he showed us that. Pay attention, pay attention in this video. Uh, this person is gonna perform a dix bike. Look at that. This is a laboratory model and the particles are stationary here. There's a mark in the laboratory with the particles here. Look what's going to happen when you do a dix bike test. The patient lay down, the particle moves away, 
And when you bring the patients to the first position, the particles do not come to the same place. They do not come to the same place, which means if I do this help like again, the delta of variation will be very small. So the nystagmus will not be intense or it will disappear itself because the cupola will not move around. This is the explanation for the fatigability of the nystagmus. It's not related to neuromechanism. Right, and this is the pictures of Professor Domenico Brist's, you know, paper. It shows us if the particles is here in the first position, and you do a dix pike the particle moves here from this position to this position, and when you move the patient back, it comes from C to B, not to A, which means the particle never come to the same position that was before. So if you do the dix pike again, the variation will be smaller than the first one. So that's the explanation for fatigability. Remember that BPPV is a biomechanical disease. And one of the questions that many patients ask to us is, well, doc, I understand that my crystals are free floating, but why the autoconia is detaching? I mean, this is a very common question. Patients say, well, I understand, but why my crystals are out of place? And the, the simple answer for that is, I don't know. And I believe nobody knows that. I, I, my personal opinion is that there is many, many chemical mechanisms in the endolymph and the utricle that we just do not understand so yet. And this mechanism, this biochemical mechanism works in this displacement. We know that age is related. This is a picture quoted from our friend, Professor Schuber from Hopkins. And this is an um, electronic microscopy of an autoconia in uh, young patients and in an old patients. We know that old patients, they have kind of uh, decalcification of the autoconia. So the autoconia has become a little bit scratched and it can you know, facilitate a displacement. So we know age is a, it's a factor. We know that head trauma is also a factor. We know there are many research right now working with the vitamin D, and uh, there's some evidence that uh, you know low levels of vitamin D increases the, the chances of recurrent BPPV. But the, the but the simple answer is we just don't know yet. We just don't know yet, yet what is going on. I hope in a few years we can answer this question. And our group we will also publish a paper trying to do some you know study regarding the, the, the solar irradiation of the, the solar light and the levels of BPPV in a population. And we just learned that in our reality in, in the south of Brazil, uh, during the winter time, during the month of May, June, July, which is the winter time here in Brazil, uh, we have less case, we have, uh, you know, we have more cases of BPPV than in, during the summertime. During the summertime, the cases are, are less than during the winter. So we learned that solar irradiation maybe have some kind of influence in BPPV. And those are some principles that I want to point out about the BPPV pathophysiology. Okay, so we're going to talk about a little bit about the diagnosis. And this is a joke that we, when we are kids, we teach our kids to find the Wally. Where is Wally? And, and, the, and, the, 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 and the point here is like the same thing we do in BPPV. We have to figure out where Wally is, right? And we have to figure out where the particles are. I mean, the particles could be anywhere. The particles, we know that it could be affecting the horizontal canal, the posterior canal, the anterior canal. And this is a very funny picture of Professor Hamag and Dave Z and Adolf Brownstein during the last part in Korea, 2016. And this is just uh, to show us that BPPV can affect each semicircular canal. We know that most part of the cases is related to the posterior canal. And there's a reason for that. And the reason for that is to understand the biomechanical. Uh, imagine that you have a patient stand up. So the autoconias are here attached to the utricle. 
when you are in bed and you spend like eight hours every single day sleeping, so one third of your life you're spending in bed. So the chances of your autoconia to become free floating during time you're in bed, those, those chances are high. And when the autoconia is detached, there are a couple possibilities. They detach it and the G-force, the gravitational force, you know, pull the autoconia through the common crura. And when the autoconia reaches the common crura, there are two possible ways. It can come to the anterior canal or it can come to the posterior canal. And the patient is in the bed, it's laid, it's laid down. When this patient get, gets up, the autoconia moves to the anterior canal, it will probably come back to the utricle, right? For the gravitational force. And the autoconia in the posterior canal, it come, goes down and become trapped in the posterior canal. So this is a very simple explanation. So why posterior canal is much more affected than any other canal? It's, it's, it's anatomical, right? So we know that the chances of the autoconia goes up to the anterior canal, it's very, it's very rare. And, and, and those chances happen especially and if you put the patient in a very, you know, neck extension, there are a couple of possibilities here. The autoconia can come to the, what we call short arm of the anterior canal, the short arm, or the autoconia will be never attached to the cupola in this side of the canal because it's pretty much impossible the autoconia do all the way around and attach it to the cupola. So if you have a cupola that ties in the anterior canal, the autoconia is supposed to be in the short arm. And if the autoconia is free floating in the anterior canal, it should be here, right? That's the reason Iacovino's maneuver worked for both uh, cupular tires or, you know, ductal tires in the anterior canal. You know, anterior canal BPPB is quite rare. I, in my personal experience, I had just a few cases. And every time I have an anterior canal BPP, I'm becoming not so confident. So I ask for the MRI and I try to study the patient a little bit more because I know that's rare. And the, the few cases that I had in my life of anterior canal BPP, all of them were because of head trauma. The patients had some kind of car accident and after the head trauma, they start having anterior canal BPP. And when we think about anterior canal, uh, you may have a downbeating nystagmus which could be persistent, especially if the autoconia is attached to the cupola or transient. And if the downbeat is transient, the chances that they are free floating is higher, right? Um, there's a single point here that I want to really to give some kind of emphasis is to understand the torsional component of the posterior canal. It's, a, it's, an, ex, it's an example of a patient with a posterior canal left side BPPV. I know that Professor Vishal Pavar is here online. He's a very good research about eye movements and I learned a lot with him about eye movements. And I wanted to point out some things here. When the patient lays down a Dixon pike, the posterior canal stimulates the vestibular nuclei and the, and the vestibular nuclei cross the stimulus through the uh, medial longitudinal fascicle and reach the fourth and the third nucleus of the ocular motor. And this nuclear stimulates what we call superior obliquus in the ipsilateral side and the inferior rectus muscle in the contralateral. So it gives us a nystagmus which is much more torsional in the same side and much more vertical in the opposite side of the eyes. It's a very, very, very real. I'm gonna play this video again so you can see in a loop way. Um, the left eye is pretty much torsional, while the right eye is pretty much vertical, right? And the explanation for that is the muscle um, simulates. And um, that's why I really strongly recommend it, that if you are doing Dixon Pike without video goggles, you're supposed to see the eye who is down because it's much more torsional, so it's easy for you to observe the torsional components. But there's a very important thing here. And Listen up. When we talk about BPPV, what gives us the diagnosis and what gives us which canal is affected is the nystagmus. It's not the maneuver you perform. It's very, very, very important. For example, pay attention to this patient here. I'm going to perform a Dix-Hopike test, which is usually performed for posterior canal, left side. 
When I put the patient in the Dixon Pike test, the patient start having a horizontal nystagmus, geotropic horizontal nystagmus. So which canal is affected? Is the posterior one? No, it's the lateral one. So remember that what gives us the diagnosis is not the maneuver that you perform, it's the nystagmus itself. It's very, very important. So pay attention to this other patient here. I'm gonna do a dix Pike test, right side, and when I put the patient down, it comes with a down beating nystagmus. Look at that. Is posterior canal affected? No, it's not posterior canal. So the point is, remember that. What gives us the diagnosis is not the maneuver you perform. What gives us the diagnosis is the nystagmus. And it's very important because um, a lot of people come to me and say, Renato, sometimes I do the, the, the dix Pike test, the patient com complains about having dizziness, having vertigo, but I haven't seen any disadvantages. And do you, do you agree and treat the patients? And my answer for that, it's absolutely not. I never treat a BPPV patient if I haven't seen the nystagmus. Because if I haven't seen the nystagmus, I don't know which canal is affected. So how I'm going to treat if I don't know if it's lateral canal or posterior canal or anterior canal. So remember that. If you haven't seen the nystagmus, the best idea is not treat the patients. The best, yes. the best idea is see the patient again. And this is a very interesting paper from Professor Halmagi from Australia. And I point out something here. He say that if you have a patient, and this story sounds like PPPV, but there's no positional nystagmus, the best idea is to see the patient again. It's, it's very common in my daily basis practical clinic. I tell my patients, well, I haven't seen your segments. Comes, comes with me in a couple of days. Come with me in a week. And when the patient comes back, I see, and sometimes I see the segments, and I figure it out which canal is affected. So I really do not recommend it people to treat BPPV if you are not seeing the nystagmus, right? And the importance of do this kind of repeat clinical examination in BPPV, it's also pointed out in a research, Professor Leah Pollack from Israel, and he showed us that sometimes the mean time between the first visit and the diagnosis of BPPV comes with 16 or 14 to 16 months, which means sometimes the patient comes to you and say, well, I have positional nystagmus, so you have an aroma of BPPV, but when you perform the positional test, the patients do not have nystagmus because they are absolutely out of crisis. And when you start seeing the patient in a different perspective, you see the BPPV. So it's, a, it's a very important to repeat the, and to see the patient again. And I don't wanna you know, run out of time here, and I'm gonna go through for treatment options for posterior canal. Because lateral canal, we're gonna have the superstar Professor Zuma to talk about. So when we talk about treatment of BPPV, this is a paper from Professor Kevin Kerber. And Professor Kerber is a very close friend of us. And he show us that when you do a randomized treatment with apple maneuver and a placebo maneuver, sham maneuver, you're gonna have an effective of about 80% with the Apple maneuver. So you have 80% chance of treating your patients if you do Apple maneuver, 80%. But the point is less than 10% of the BPPV patients really receive the treatment. So it's, it's, it's incredible because um, just a few patients really have the treatment, right? Uh, and, and, and I'm asking myself, what's the reason of that? In my opinion, there are many reasons that comes for the lack of knowledge about physiology and vestibular pathology. It comes for financial um, aspects. Sometimes there are so few countries that the medical doctor, they are not reimbursed by the maneuvers. But one of the point is, I know many ENT docs that do not have a medical stretcher in their office. They do not have a stretcher. So if you do not have a stretcher, how are you gonna do the maneuver? So I, when I get into a otorolaryngologist, you know, office, I look around and I always looking for some kind of medical stretcher. And if patients do not have the stretcher, I well, this guy do not treat PPV. And when we talk about posterior canal, there are 
two kind of maneuvers, which is Simone's maneuver and Lepley maneuvers. And, and the funny part here is because people treat this maneuver as a fight. I mean, they try to do comparison between Apple, between Simone. You have some people who are defending Simone maneuver. Some people are defending Apple maneuver. And my point is both of them works beautifully. If you do Simone maneuver in a right way, or if you do Apple maneuver in a right way, both of them are just great for posterior canal. And in my personal opinion, there are some strong evidence and weak evidence about the, the maneuvers, but my point of view, it's much more a patriotic issue, right? If you go to the United States, most of the doctors use the Apple maneuver. If you go to Europe, especially in France, many of the doctors use Simon maneuver. And just because I'm not American, I'm not European, I use both maneuvers and they just, just work beautifully. But even though I use both maneuvers, I have one that I like the most. And the one that I like the most is Apple maneuver, not because it's better, but because I become it's easier to do. Even though they work perfectly, they have different principles. Apple maneuver works for gravity and Simone maneuver works for inertia. And those principles are absolutely different. Uh, it's, a, it's a funny movie here just to give an explanation. Uh, this movie shows you what is gravity. So Zach Newton was in, the, in the, the tree and the apple comes fall on his hand and he look at the apple and say, well, there's a gravity rule. This is gravity, okay? And this is inertia, right? This is inertia. And these principles are what's happened in Apple and in Simon Maneuver. When you perform Apple Maneuver, you have to remember, you are not treating the patient. Who is treating the patient is the G-force, is the gravitational force. This is what's treating the patient. So when you lay down the patient, you have to do it slowly because there's no reason to do fast because the gravitational force is work even though you work if you do it slowly. So I do Apple Maneuver, I put the patient in the first position and the patient's there and the G-force just pull the, the autoconia and the autoconia moves to this position. You do to the other position and the G-force is pull the, the crystal. You do the third position and the G-force moves the autoconia back to the autocon. That's a tip here. That's a tip. Um, some people ask me, how many maneuvers do I perform? And my answer is, it depends. How, how depends? Depends of what? Depends how confident I am in my Apple maneuver. If you see in this third position here, if you see in this third position, I'm down beating this diagnosis, it's a good sign. It's a good sign because there's an explanation for that. See this video here. She's performing an Apple maneuver. Look at that. She lay down in the left side, she moves to the right, the autoconia is moving here, but when she goes for the third position and the autoconia goes for the common crura, some of the autoconias go for the anterior canal. And when she moves back, the autoconia comes from the anterior canal to the utricle. Let's pay attention to that. When the autoconias are coming to the common crura, some of them go to the anterior canal. And if they go to the anterior canal, you generate a flow that is the opposite the flow that comes for the posterior canal. So the torsional components just know itself and the vertical components increase. So that's the reason when you are in the third position, you got some down beating status. It, and it's a very good sign that you are performing a good airplane maneuver, right? Now I'm going to perform a bad a bad Simon maneuver. Look at that. You put the patient down in a, in a very slow way, which is not the correct way to do that. And if you move the patients to the other way in a slow form, the autoconia will still here in the posterior canal. So you're not moving the autoconia itself. So when you apply Simon maneuver, you have to do something like that we lay down the patient and move the patient really fast. Because when you move the fast, you stop the autoconia and start moving. So you have an inertia component. Remember, BPPV, it's a biomechanical disease, right? So 
I remember once I was giving a talk about BPV and one of my colleagues asked me a question. He said, Renato, I, I understand the, 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 the repositional principle, I agree. But the question is, when you move back the autoconius to the utricle, the autoconius is attached again? Because if, if it detached it, because some reason is happening in the utricle, so when you put it back, it's going to attach it again? And they say, well, there's, there's, a, good, there's a good point. There's, there's a good point in asking that. And there's a paper published in Japan for a Japanese group. I strongly recommend everybody to read that. And they did an animal model, an experimental model of BPPV. So they put a frog, otoconia, and utricular mass, and they just drop an otoconia in the utricle and they move the, the macula of the utricle like that to see if the otoconia is going to detach, right? And the good point, they did three different experimentals. The first one, the macula was intact. The first one, the macula was a little bit dilacerate. And the third one, they just removed the macula, absolutely removed the macula. And the result of the experimental is that most of the autoconia attached immediately uh, after you reposition on that in a good macula. 100% uh, of the autoconia attached in a very dilacerated macula after three minutes. And a pretty good number of autoconia attached again in utricle after five minutes, even in the group that you remove the macula. So what, what's, what we should learn from that? Um, when people ask me, is there any reason for keeping the patient with some of restriction way, like after you reposition and you put the patient like for two days in a cervical neck collar, and they say, well, I don't do that. I just recommended the patients to be like 20 minutes in my office, instead of that, and after that, I just released the patients because the animal study, of course, it's an animal study, the animal studies show us that the autoconia, it might attach it again in a few minutes, right? And another point, uh, sometimes people ask me, well, I did the apple maneuver and the patient, did the dixapite maneuver and the patients complain about dizziness or vertigo, but I haven't seen any studies. So what is the explanation for that? Some people call it what we call subjective BPPV. I don't like this term. I, I, I just don't like this subjective BPPV. But they ask me why it happened. And there's three reasonable explanations for that. First reason is because you're performing the maneuver without a way to remove fixation. So I strongly recommend everybody to have, if you do not have a video nystagmo, a video otoscopy in your clinical practice, just buy a friends of Google. Professor Michael Stroop, he has a very light one, they call M glass, it's a cheap one. So I, I strongly recommend that everybody should do the maneuvers without uh, fixation because sometimes just because of the fixation, you inhibit it, the nystagmus. So one of the reasons that you haven't seen the nystagmus is because you're not using the, you know, a good device to see the, the eyes. Second explanation is sometimes the nystagmus is very fast and the patient blinks and the medical doctor just do not pay attention and haven't seen that. But the third reason of my explanation is because sometimes the autoconia mass is so light, it's so small autoconia, it's like autoconia dust that is uh, moving around. And this small mass do not displace the cupola and you haven't seen any segment, but the patient feels something is wrong. And, and this is a very reasonable explanation for that regarding the biomechanical concept. There's an author from, from Europe, from Austria, Professor Bela Buki, and he, published very good papers about BPPV. I also recommend you to go through these patients, these papers, and they try to give some explanation for a typical BPPV. Um, let's pay attention in a patient stand up. Imagine that the, the autoconia uh, just displacement while you're standing up. So if, if displacement while you're standing up, the chance to get, go through for the common period is small. So the chances that goes to this short arm of the posterior canal is much higher. If the particle is here, right? If the particle is here, when you put the patient a dixal pike test, the particle just moves back to the utricle and will not generate nystagmus, but the patients may feel some wobbly sensation, okay? 
Now, imagine that the particle displacement to the short arm of the posterior canal and just attach it to the cupola, right? When you put patients back, depending to the angle that you are putting back, the, the G-force is gonna push the particles, but the particle which is attached is not pull the cupola, so you have no nystagmus. But if you put the patient a little bit more in an next extension, you're gonna have this uh, G-force, you know, pulling the cupola in the, in toward the utricle, so you're gonna inhibit it, the posterior canal. If you inhibit the posterior canal, you're gonna probably have some kind of mild down beating torsional nystagmus. So pay attention what I'm telling you. I'm telling you a case of posterior canal BPPV and the patient has down beating nystagmus, which is not a regular type because in regular type, the osteoconia is here in the big arm, not in the short arm. But you have to remember that because there's possible to happen that. Here's a video trying to show us how the particles goes through the, the, the short arm. Look at that. She, she's performing um, a Eppler maneuver. Look at that. She's laid down, goes to another side, goes to the third position, and the otoconia goes to the anterior canal. Pay attention here. Some of the otoconia is going to the anterior canal, which is a good sign. She probably gets some down beating nystagmus here, right? And then she moves back to the neutral position. And then when she moves back, some delta conia comes to the utricle, but some of them comes to the short arm of the posterior canal. And that's the explanation for that. And I'm gonna show two patients, two patients, very interesting cases. Look at that. This is a patient from Professor Zuma. Look at that. He's gonna do, and he, he's gonna show to you our approach, which is the bowing lean test. Look at that. He's gonna do a bow test, put the head down the patients start having a downbeating nystagmus, downbeating, right? And he was, well, what, what's going on, right? What's going on to having downbeating nystagmus? And when he put the head up in a lean position, look at that. When he put the head up in a lean position, this patient, look at that. Look at that. It comes for a right torsional upbeating nystagmus. So where the particles are? The particles are in the posterior canal right side, but they are not in the usual position, right? He's gonna do a Dick's help eye test. Look at that, to the right side, and the nystagmus is pretty much torsional, right? Torsional in the right side, more vertical in the left side. And the explanation for that is because the autoconia is here, right? It's not like here, which is the most common position. So when he do the bow, then he start, the autoconia moves in the way to the utricle, and that you inhibit the canal. So that's the reason you got some down beating. And when you put back in the lean position, you stimulate the posterior canal, and you got some torsional nystagmus. So remember that the autoconia it might be anywhere in the canal, and you have to figure it out where it is. I have one of my patients that happened the same thing. Look at that. Uh, I'm gonna shut the eyes and I'm gonna do a bound test. I, I hope you guys are seeing the video. Uh, if you have any questions. Yes, it, it was fine. It was fine. So I put the head down. She will have some down beating, down beating, right? And I was like, what's going on? Down beating sadness. And when I put the head up, she got some torsional. Look at that. When I put the head up, she got the, look at that. She got some, wait a second, because the autocon is supposed to move. Remember the biomechanical principle, the latency, then it will start right now. Look at that, it's very mild one. Look at that. Oops, 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 oops. It's a torsional right beating. So the, the autoconia is in the right posterior canal. And I'm gonna confirm that in a Dix Halpike test. Move the head to the right, lay down, and you're gonna see the torsional 
oops, oops, torsional nystagmus. So the autoconia was in the posterior canal, but it was in a different position than most of the patients. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop right now. And I really would like to thank you, Professor Mohammed, for the kindly invitation. It's an honor for me. I'd like to thank you, our colleagues, our partners. We have almost 200 persons online right now. And I'm gonna leave the lateral canal, which is the fun part for Professor Zuma. Thank you very much, I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's, it's a wonderful and amazing presentation, Dr. Renato. We'll keep the questions uh, until the end. I think we'll have much fun about the question, but thank you. It was really one of the best presentations we heard. Uh, we are going to take all the questions at the end. Uh, I think this is, will be much uh, better. Well, can you hear me? Everybody hear me? Yes. Hello. We are okay. Fine. Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening for everyone. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank Dr. Afahgal Mohammed for the invitation. Thanks for having me in this show. Uh, I'm very excited to talk about lateral canal. Don't like, uh, I don't have the English fluency like my colleague, Renato Cal, but I'm trying to, to speak slowly, okay? So, whenever we talk about the lateral canal BPPV, you have to think about the anatomy and the physiology. Why this? Because knowledge of anatomy and pathophysiological mechanism of the semicircular canal is essential for the correct diagnosis and treatment of any BPPV. I mean, repeat the correct diagnosis and treatment of any BPPV. So you have to have patient. So what is what about the goal of our presentation? First and foremost, I'd like to clarify slowly some pathological mechanism. That is very, very important to me when you deal with the Laranau Canal. So, the first, the diagnosis, the correct diagnosis. The second goal is the management of the apogeotropic lateral canal. And the third one, the management of geotropic variant. Let's see the diagnosis of the lateral canal. Uh, I use the same uh, picture from Hanato Kao. Where is Oli? Whenever. <laughs> Whenever I, I, I'm facing with patient with BPPV, I ask to myself, what is Oli? What is Oli? Wait, what's going on? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Professor. We hear you, but uh, the show, slide show is not, uh, uh, we see this, uh, uh, artistic, like... Uh, yes, but, uh, but wait a minute, let, let me see if, uh, wait a minute. Where are I don't know what's going on. Where is Wally? Uh, this okay, is, uh, okay. Th that's okay now, that's okay now. Well, why? Because the geotropic variant of the stem, the lateral stem circle, the canal, why it doesn't work you? But that's something wrong. Hello? Yes, Professor, we hear you. But it doesn't work, my computer. What's going on, my God? Take your time. Mm -hmm. It's no issue if you want to restart or to close and restart your PowerPoint, it's fine. Professor Zuma, try, try, try to change the slides in using the, the mouse. No, do not click in the... Okay, let me see. Okay. No, 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 no. 
I don't know what's going on. It doesn't work. It's stuck. My gosh. Take your time. No, no issue. Uh, we can take uh, one or two questions, uh, Dr. Renato. So we make use of the time. Uh, I, I'm absolutely available, Professor. If you have any question, we can discuss. So just, can... just answer why. Okay. You are... okay, he came back. Okay, okay bros. Need me to make him. Okay. Uh... Yes, perfect. Let me see if it does work now. We hope so. Oh my gosh, no. Okay. Let me to make you a co-host again, so you can share your... Uh... Allow me to, to share yes, my, yes, my, my yes, screen, yes. please. Yes, I'm working on it. No, it doesn't work. Still, 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 I didn't get... Uh, I'm rolling. Okay, so just listen. Yes, I got it. Yes, professor, now it's, uh, you get it. You can share now, professor. Okay, let me see if it's gonna work. Yeah. Okay. Well, the geotropic uh, semicircular canal variant. No, it doesn't work. The particulars are and the posterior arm, okay? And the apple geotropic lateral semicircular canal, the particle is attributed to free floating and the anterior arm or attached to the cupola canal, as you see here, or cupola utricular canal, the three situations. The diagnosis of the side effect is critical for successful. That is very, very important. <clears throat> so on the basis of our experience, we have adopted the strategy of minimal stimulus for the diagnosis. This strategy has been written by Dr. Aspella di Bonatti in 2005. It's very important. I, I have been doing this for more than 10 years. So it's very important, as Dr. Renato uh, said, uh, suppressing the visual fixation. You have a lot of device, electronic devices on and Google for that. So, we started the strategy looking for the pseudo spontaneous nystagmus in the CT position. The next step is to realize the performance, the bow and lean test. After that, the third step is the sit supine position. And the last one is to perform the uh, uh, role test maneuver, okay? Just as a more, more uh, 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 the first one, my gosh. Well, let's go to the pseudonystagmus spontaneous. 
given the fact that the lateral canal is uh, inclined, the inclination of the third degree, we got two situations. In the case of geotropic, the particles are in posterior arm, the flow is inhibitory. And the cases of apogeotropic, the particles are here, uh, so the flow is excitatory. That is very important. The bowling test, when you tilt the head forward 60 degree, in the cases of the geotropic like a particular in the posterior arm is excitatory. Now you're gonna have a strong nystagmus. Conversely, in apogeotropic, the flow is inhibitory. Don't, don't forget this, this is very important. When I got a strong nystagmus in geotropic, in, in this position, in bow position, is the particular R and posterior R. When they perform the lean test, it means their head is tilted 45 degrees back head. And in cases apogeotropic, it will be excitatory, a strong nystagmus. And the geotropic nystagmus will be, it, 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 the flow is inhibitory. This is interesting paper written by Dr. Marcelli that uh, showed that the intensity of the nystagmus and the direction and the bowing link test can add, can help us to show, to, to, to add the, the diagnostic. Let me see the flu chart. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, the bowl test, when I perform the bowl test, if I have a stronger nystagmus, it means that you are facing geotropic ca cases. And the direction of the stagnant show the affect side. Conversely, when I perform the lean test and then I have a strong nystagmus, which means this is the apogeotropic, apogeotropic and the direction of the nystagmus show the affect side. The next test, is the sit supine position, okay? Now, I lay down the, pa the patients, and uh, in cases of apogeotropic, the flow is excitatory, it's, it's like a lean test. And the geotropic, the flow is inhibitory. The last one is the sit, the supine row test. Look at the case on the right lateral canal. In the case of the geotropic variant, when they lie down the patient for the, the, the affect the side, it is, the flow is excitatory. So I have a strong nystagmus beating to the earth. Conversely, when I turn the head to the other side, to an affect the side, the, 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 the stimulation will be inhibitory. So, the nystagmus is quick and beating uh, as well to, to the earth. In the cases of apogeotropic nystagmus, when I lay down the patients to an to, 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 to affect side, I got an excitatory nystagmus and the nystagmus beating to the ceiling. And I turn the head to the, to the right side the flow is inhibitory. So I got an apogeotrop and it started beating to the ceiling, but it is very, very weak. Uh, that's the effect side. In fact, if you look at the two tests, the bow and lean, the bow test and the red roll to the right position, it is pretty much the same. We put the lateral canal and the, and the same position in the vertical uh, under, under with the, the gravity. That is very interesting. It's pretty much the same. Well, how to treat the lateral canal? Uh, I would like to highlight this statement that we wrote in the, our latest paper from Frontier. There is no single correct maneuver 
for each kind of BPPV. Since several authors have reported good results with different types of repositioning, repositioning maneuver. Personal experience is really important for defining a strategy to manage these patients. Okay? Well, but there is some important rules when we are performing this maneuver. The first rule is to start from the affect side to unaffect side. And two concepts to think about when we are performing maneuver that are called, uh, uh, told very well about this, the plan and the force. What is the force? The gravity, the angular acceleration, and the inertia. That's very important to think when we are performing this maneuver, position maneuver. Well, Let's see how can we manage the apogeotropic lateral semicircular BPPV. Remember, three situations. The particles is attributed to three floating and anterior arm, the cupola attach, canal side, or cupola attach to a tricular side. Okay, the goal is to remove back the particle to utricle. Okay. Okay, the first maneuver for apogeotropic was the modified Guffon maneuver, modified by Appiani. We lay down the patients, we lay down the patient at the affected site with the effects that which breaks the acceleration and using the inertia. And after that, a rapid acceleration, angular acceleration, nose up 45 degrees. They use, so, inertia and gravity. And roughly 90% can transform apogeotropic variant and geotropic variant. So we need a new, another maneuver. Another maneuver was written by Vanucci, the head shaking maneuver. Head shake, like, oh, I'm gonna perform the head shake test. Well, the goal of this maneuver is just accelerate and decelerate and break autoconic degrees and the test from the cupola, this autolytus from the cupola. Uh, another interesting maneuver uh, is cupola lattice described by King, cupola lattice repositional maneuver, uh, written in 2012. It start the, pa the patient with a supine position, with no brick acceleration, they turn, the head to turn 135 degrees to affect the side and sometimes they use the vibration. And after that, he turned the patient to unaffect the side uh, 90 degrees in each disposition. Okay, and finish with the prone position. They, would, uh, they use my start acceleration and the gravity. And uh, it's interesting because they solve cupola lattice at the utricular side. Uh, in 2016, we published our maneuver. We start with patient sitting and the same brisk acceleration as a Guffoni Apiano maneuver in order to detach the autoconia. It's important to stay uh, in patient, remain the patient at least three minutes in each position, okay? The second step is to turn up or 90 degrees, not 45 degrees, with the rapid, rapid angular acceleration, using gravity and inertia. In this position, we try to convert 
apogeotropic and geotropic. And the third position, we turn to unaffected side 90 degrees with uh, rapid acceleration and uh, acceleration, gravity, gravity and inertia. And the fourth, this is very important, this is for contribution from Professor Rabbit, is to tilt the head, slide forward, uh, in order to avoid it to come back to the, ca the canal. That is a very important uh, uh, position. And now, get the patient sit. The last one. So, utilize uh, inertia and gravity. So, we solve in the, at the same time uh, cupulonatized otriculocyte. Let's see, uh, I don't know if it's the move. It's working the, vi the video? I think it is. It's working, Professor. Okay, this will perform the zoom maneuver. 90 degree to an effect side. That's the first rule. Okay, tilt the head down. Okay, and finish. But, but this is very fast. You didn't wait in this uh, demonstration, right? It, it, it is very, very fast. Yes, this is for, for presentation, okay? <laughs> you have to stay in each step at least three minutes, okay? Repeat again, Professor well, Beliz. Repeat it again. We need to see it again, the maneuver. To hear again? The steps. Yeah, bit the maneuver. Yeah, please. Oh, wait a minute. It does work. Ah, okay, okay. I think it's fine. It's gone. Okay. Line down to the affected side, you can see. Right side here, right side is affected side. So lying on the right. Side. You can see here, yes. Ah, nice. 90 degree and plus to an affected side in 90 degree. Okay. Perfect. Okay, last year we published this paper with my group, Bernardo Ramos. That interesting because you can assume where the otoliths are probably located by observing the pattern of nystagmus evoked in each step of zoom maneuver in patient with apogeotropic lateral BPPV. Let's see. In case of the particular R in the anterior arm, as you look at here, the first step we have a transient nystagmus beating apogeotrop to unaffected site. In the second position, the same direct, I have to do the same direct of the nystagmus, okay, and transient as well. And in the third position, uh, the geotropic nystagmus, which means the same direct of an nystagmus and anterior, if the particles are in the anterior arm. If the particles are attached to the cupola canal, and the first step, I have no transient nystagmus, a persistent nystagmus, that being to affect side, the unaffected side, that way, sorry. So the second position, uh, the same nystagmus, I have to do the same nystagmus, being to unaffected side. Uh, and the third position, the geotropic nystagmus as the anterior uh, arm. If the particles are in the triculus side, like this, I have in the same position the persistent apical geotropic nystagmus, but in the second position, there is an inversion of the nystagmus, a persistent nystagmus leading to affect the side. That's the difference. And uh, the third position, the same, or inversion. So, to, to summarize, the anterior arm in the three position, I have the same direction of the nystagmus. Okay? Directs away to the health side. In the case of cupola utriculo, I have an inversion and the second position, inversion of the nystagmus in the second position. So,
So, the particles of the stab in the zoom maneuver can locate where the particles are and reassure the, diag the, the diagnosis. Just to see for this. Well, we finished the management of geotropic lateral geotropic uh, canal. Remember the particle are in the posterior arm. And the goal is to wait, put the, the particles into a trickle. The first maneuver is Lampert maneuver, described as Lampert maneuver. Uh, lie down, the, the patient is in the supine position and they turn the head to an effect side, okay? To an effect side in order to, 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 to put the, the, the particles into utricle. It works. There are a lot of people that uh, use this performance which is successful. They use the inertia and gravity. Another uh, maneuver is force prolonged position. They use the gravity. Another one is Gufuni maneuver. This is the more common, more uh, uh, um, maneuver. The problem is different from the apogeotropic uh, uh, variant. They lay down the patients to unaffect side. In these cases, they affect side at the right side. They lay down the patient uh, doing the brisk, brisk deceleration and inertia and a rapid angular acceleration, nose down. That's the difference. They use inertia and gravity. Well, uh, most uh, colleagues from South America and Mexico uh, told me once, oh, I, I perform a zoom maneuver for geotropic and apogeotropic cases. Oh my God. And this works well. So we think about a long time and we recently published this paper again with Renato uh, Ramos, uh, Renato Cal, uh, modifying, a simply modify zoom maneuver. The modify is in the first step. When the patients are sitting, okay, the head is turned 45 degrees to an affect side and lay down the patient and follow the steps from zoom maneuver for apogeotropic geotropic uh, uh, variant. The result is very interesting. Uh, it, it works very, very well utilize uh, inertia and gravity. Let's see the, the, the video. The particular are in the posterior arm of the same circular canal. She had the turn of the head, 45 degree, lay down at the same side, the affected side, you can see the particles going to near the utricle. 45 degrees, the same steps of zoom maneuver, and 90 degrees to unaffected side, head down, and okay, it's easy. It's not necessary to wait three minutes in this case. So, to summarize, how to treat uh, lateral canal? First and foremost, most important, correct diagnosis with this device. Second, anatomy and pathophysiology knowledge. The third one, unsinger application. We maneuver for both cases. The same maneuver. So, on the basis of our experience, the reposition maneuver for lateral canal, for April geotropic, you can use zoom maneuver and modify zoom maneuver for geotropic case. Uh, I, I, I like to show this paper because uh, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, this paper is interesting. I strongly recommend it because intractable benign BPPV, um, you can see the abnormality in the semicircular canal. 
is not hair. This, this, this paper shows it's not hair. Uh, don't, don't forget this. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor uh, Zuma. Uh, now I know what was wrong in uh, doing the Zuma maneuver. So uh, <laughs> now it's very clear for me. I see the similarity between uh, the last part of your maneuver and uh, and uh, Asprilla maneuver, uh, right? I'm correct. The uh, last half of your maneuver is similar to Asprilla maneuver. But the Sprilla maneuver have to do at least five or six times in order to reposition the maneuver. Yes, I That's agree. The difference. I agree, but it's the movement itself. It's uh, the last half looks uh, ah, similar. Exactly. Yes, this okay. is, makes similar. sense. Uh, uh, thank you very much. It's, it's a great, and I think people enjoying as myself. Uh, so, so I suggest can you repeat again what is the difference between Zuma and uh, modified Zuma maneuver? Sorry to interrupt. Uh, he, he explained uh, clearly, uh, he showed in the uh, video the starting position should be 45 uh, for the modified Zuma maneuver. Uh, then you go to the second half of. Uh, Zuma maneuver. I'm right, uh, uh, Professor Zuma? Basma. Exactly. So uh, we can get more questions, but because uh, we have a very rich program, I just prepared the presentation based on the questions. We put a post that we are going to have a, a BBV day, and uh, I thought it will be nice to uh, let the people ask their questions and about what uh, confusing points and which points needs more uh, clarification, uh, especially in the privilege of uh, presence of Professor Zuma and uh, Dr. Renato Kal. So uh, in my presentation, I just put the questions. So uh, we'll start and some of them I prepared the answers. Some of them uh, I would like also to have uh, some input from uh, our guest speakers. So slideshow from beginning. Can you see my uh, slides, right? Right. Perfect. Right. So on the left, this is where I work. I work in a tertiary care hospital, uh, King of Aziz Medical City with a college of medicine, nursing, uh, physical therapy, uh, and the speech and hearing uh, program. So this is where I work. The logo in the first is this is for the Audiology Vestibular International Science Academy, which is uh, some sort of a progression of uh, what we have been doing in Facebook uh, for years. Uh, now we are uh, building a new platform for more focused and uh, highly scientific and uh, effective uh, activities. So our first project is the Online Vestibular Diploma. And I am happy to hear the great enthusiasm of Professor uh, Zuma and Dr. Renato Kell about the online vestibular diploma. And it's our no, uh, honor and the great pleasure to have them uh, both as a faculty uh, in the coming online vestibular diploma. And already we assigned for them the uh, horizontal canal management uh, plus some physiology and anatomy uh, lectures from uh, Professor Zuma. Uh, and this is, will add a lot to the program. Um, and uh, on the right, this is our Facebook uh, group uh, logo uh, that's hosting all these uh, webinars during the COVID time. So uh, I will skip the slides, which has been covered very well uh, by our guest speakers. It just uh, maybe because we were discussing something about the light cobula and heavy cobula. So I think I quoted this video from a physical therapist website. It's called uh, vestibular today, but it's good to know that is the cobula uh, is a jelly-like. So it's a jelly-like structure as you see. <coughs> okay, and if we uh, go back one more slide, I want you to focus. That is the blood supply uh, is uh, for the semicircular canals is going mainly from the cobula. That's why in alcoholic positional nystagmus, 
you find the pattern of positional of, um, alcoholic nystagmus. That's why the copula get first to become light uh, with alcohol. Then after a few hours, it become heavy because the early entry of alcohol into the semicircular canals, it first enter the copula rather than the endolymph because of the blood supply. And when it's cleared uh, from the alcohol, copula clears first before then the endolymph. And this is what creates the specific pattern of uh, positional alcoholic nystagmus. And we will discuss this in answering one of the questions. And, and cobulolithiasis and canalolithiasis has been uh, very clearly explained by our guest speaker. But let's see to add, I do believe, and I think many other uh, uh, professionals also believe that is canalolithiasis is, uh, uh, is most likely the basophysiology uh, of BBV in most of the cases. Uh, personally, very few cases which I believe they have uh, cobulolithiasis. And uh, when like in uh, horizontal canal, I have the abodeotropic type in our experience, we uh, believe more that always it's uh, because of the non-ambulary arm uh, autoconia or short arm autoconia, rather than the cobulolithiasis. In our experience, it just must um, much less uh, uh, is 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 uncommon to see the cobulolithiasis. Most of our cases is canalolithiasis either in the ambulary uh, uh, arm of the semicircular canal or in the non ambulatory part of the semicircular canal. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so uh, uh, the null point. Uh, the null point. Uh, it's a, it's it's a concept. It's a seen in uh, light cobula and heavy cobula, and sometimes uh, described in the abogeotropic nystagmus or abogeotropic uh, BBV. But it's mainly intended to, uh, this term is mainly intended to be used in the heavy copula and the light copula. And it is defined that when the head is slightly turning to the affected side in the subine position until the horizontal semicircular canal copula is aligned with the plane of gravitational factors and stagmas stops. This is referred as the null point. At this point, the copula neither floats or sinks and does not stimulate or inhibit the canal. And this is, has some clinical significance when we comes to uh, the questions, especially about the heavy copula and the light copula. Okay, I think uh, uh, this uh, the head pitch maneuver or bow and lean maneuver uh, very well highlighted. Uh, by uh, Professor Zuma and Dr. Renato Kat. My question for them uh, is, uh, you do, uh, based on the work of our dear friend, Professor Asprilla Libonato, you do it with the minimum stimulus uh, technique in BBV. Uh, you start it routinely in all your cases. You do the head pitch first, right? You hear me, Professor Zuma, I want to hear from you. Or Dr. Renato. Right, that's correct, that's correct. Yeah, my question first, and to clarify to the audience, how many degree, uh, Darwin, you pitch is ahead? 30 degrees or 60 degree because uh, there is a significant difference between the two. So it's 30. 60 degree, the bow, 60. 60 so 60 degree. degree. Bow, yeah, exactly. Okay. And so the lean, 45 degree. So is it? The answer. And the answer for that, how many you put the head down or up, is just because you want the gravitational force to act. So if you if you down the head just a little bit, it probably you're gonna decrease the gravitational force. So that's the reason you need to go really to 60 degree and up to, to, to you know, trying to make the autoconius move around. So this is important point because I think there is come some confusion between 30 degree and 60 degree. So we'll take your uh, expertise in this, that is for the uh, bow and lean, or what we call head pitch test, right? Uh, it's a 60 degree leaning forward or bowing, 60 degree. So this is the standard way how uh, to do. And my other question for you uh, is, 
uh, typically uh, this is uh, intended to be used to add more diagnostic information for the horizontal canal BBV. But I see that uh, you do also when uh, with the posterior canal BBV. So what's, you do it for any case or what? what, what, uh, what, what, what uh, how you do in your practice? Um, if I understand the question, you asking me if I perform the head pitch test in everybody or just yes, in a few cases? Yes, yes, this is the question, exactly. Okay, I, our approach is like everybody who comes to the office and the history sounds like BPPV, we always apply the head pitch test first because sometimes if you put the goggle and you see some pseudo spontaneous nystagmus, which is much more related to the sensitivity of gravity, right, in the lateral canal, then the autocon is moving. We really go for the approach and treat lateral canal before to go for this half eye test. So we usually do the, the, the minimum approach of Professor Sperla first in everybody. I do the same. Perfect, Professor. And I share with you the same. I have few cases of posterior canal BBV, typical one, and a typical one or abogeodrobic type. Both of them, they show some nystagmus in the uh, bow and the lean test. So I have few cases even of uh, like uh, typical uh, posterior canal. They show a few beats of down beating in the stigmas. And I have a few cases of average trophic posterior canal, which is show is also um, in the sitting or in the power position, some, uh, some beats uh, of upbeating in the stigmas. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation that also you can see some finding uh, with the posterior canal. So in our experience, uh, agree uh, with you. Uh, okay, this is very important point. Uh, uh, what is your limit, you keep on all uh, your uh, latest paper very nicely, transient uh, nystagmus, transient uh, deuterobic or abogeotropic nystagmus. So what is the definition of uh, transient? The uh, Barani Society guidelines propose the two minutes. Uh, and I want to hear your opinion. What's your cut off of what is transient positional nystagmus? And what is persistent uh, 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 positional nystagmus? To me, the position uh, transition nystagmus, the, the duration is less than two minutes. I agree with Baron society. Or Perfect. when they stop it. Okay, this is good. When the nystagmus persistence, it lasts more than three, three minutes sometimes. But I would like to, to clarify some uh, 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 an aspect. Before I perform a positional test, uh, the strategy is very important to me to the bad side, to do the bad side examination in patients, ocular moral, uh, 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 the bad side in, in hope. In, in, do you understand? Okay. That's, uh, that's uh, good. In, I follow Aspirilla Libonati cutoff point for uh, minutes to say it's be resistant nystagmus. And I'm here, I'm sharing a shot. I got it from uh, last week, one of my patients who has uh, recurrent abogeotropic horizontal canal BBV. And if you can see here, the nystagmus, right beating nystagmus in the left lateral position, was lasting more than uh, 220 seconds. So uh, this is, I believe some cases, uh, uh, the transit nystagmus lasts uh, up to six, uh, up to four minutes. And uh, a personal uh, communication with Lionel, Professor Lionel Lewis, he mentioned something that one of his cases of agiotropic nystagmus, it was like uh, uh, last up to six minutes. So uh, uh, I mean, for me, uh, the cut off of one minute or two minutes, especially in the horizontal canal, especially abogeotropic type, 
uh, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, I have cases which I treated as uh, regularly uh, and they cleared completely. And we did MRI and MRI was free. So we know 100% it was apogeotropic, uh, mm -hmm. just a typical apogeotropic horizontal canal BBV. And the duration of nystagmus, as you see from this real case, uh, is up to like three or four minutes. Uh, Dr. Renato, may, may I say? Pro, 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 professor, in this yes. case, sometimes in the persistent position on this time, I use the vibration as king. Okay? And sometimes uh, you, you stop the nystagmus. You can stop this nystagmus with vibration, sometimes. If it doesn't work, I realized the image exam. Yeah, but yes, Dr. One of the things that I want to add here is like sometimes I, I don't be so restricted with the time. So because I, as, as according to our hypothesis of the biomechanical, I personally agree with you. Sometimes you have transient nystagmus that goes up for one minute or two minutes. So I, I, I don't want to say, you know, I spend the, uh, the same time in each position of the maneuver because I'm really studying the nystagmus behavior. So if you're dealing with transient nystagmus, uh, you're supposed to turn the head after the nystagmus shut down in each position. And I, I had cases of transient nystagmus that were up to two minutes or more. I fully agree and thank you because we don't have to be very strict and to rush into uh, uh, labeling a central type or something just because the nystagmus lasts more than two minutes. I think it's always worthy if you don't have other suggestive signs of central pathology, I think uh, it's wise to try the maneuver first because I believe I like much uh, your uh, statement, Dr. Renato, that there is a lot of variation about the duration of nystagmus, because there is a lot of variation in the physics of autoconomy. I fully if you, agree. If you ask me how many times do I wait in an apply maneuver in each position, my answer will be depends. Depends because I'm, I'm concerning about the size of the autoconomies and it's the, the duration of nystagmus. So I, I just move the head when I'm quite sure that the autoconomies just settle down in each position. So I, okay. I, I just do not concern about the time. Perfect. So we have the, uh, this is, those are the questions from our audience. We'll start by the first question. What is the boundary to differentiate residual symptoms after repositioning the maneuver and the recurrence of BBV? So what's your uh, cutoff uh, uh, time? Like one week, two weeks, three weeks, three days. Uh, so uh, what is the cutoff of to um, uh, uh, determine this is uh, a recurrence or failure of the maneuver? Um, I'm, 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 I'm going to give you a very simple question. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what is the boundary is because my, my whole point is I usually see the patient again after my repositional test one week. So I try to perform the maneuver and see the patient one week after that. Sometimes the patients are much better, and one week after that, he just come back and, you know, having positional vertigo again. So I really don't have a very strict answer for this question. I believe that sometimes um, you reposition in most part of the maneuvers, and the patients improve a little bit, but they still have some residual pathology. Sometimes they are much better. So, sorry, I, I don't have a very good answer. I don't know if Professor Zuma have. No, no, I agree with you. It's sometimes difficult, okay? I see patients uh, one week to after, to, in order to retest the patients. Lateral canal, I see five, de uh, five days be, uh, uh, after. But uh, I don't have the answer as well. Yeah, I, we did uh, like a poll in our group uh, with uh, many professionals uh, participated in it. So uh, it was some sort of agreement about three weeks time. So if, uh, if you get like a recurrence within a three weeks, uh, uh, our group members from the experts, they do believe that is, it was most likely unsuccessful maneuver or uh, incomplete resolution of the debris and the uh, autoconia. So let's see to take the other question. We don't have for this question sharp answer, but uh, uh, 
um, it's uh, I don't personally I don't believe that is if uh, the symptoms didn't clear within few weeks that is uh, a new episode of PBV. It's most likely there was uh, incom incomplete clearance of the debris or autoconia. Uh, so uh, second question: Should patient follow lifestyle modifications to prevent relapse after repositioning maneuver? In case what kind and for how long? Uh, you would like to comment, Dr. Renato or Professor Zuma? Um, you know, usually I, my, my protocol is like after a repositional maneuver, I ask the patient to be like 20 minutes in my waiting room, in my office. And after 20 minutes, I just realize the patient, you know, I, I don't give strict, you know, behavior for the patient. I say, you, you go home and live your life. But I just recommended that they are not, you know, play yoga or, you know, or hardly had movements for at least 24 hours, but, but nothing, nothing very strict. I say, you know, go home, live your regular life without any, you know, more active behavior. Uh, we, we use it. Yes, professor, go on, please. We have the same protocol. We work together. So, but uh, sometimes I ask the patients of the, 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 the level of vitamin D. That is very important now eh, to me. So I'm, I'm seeing patients with low level of vitamin D, okay? Uh, we fully agree about the vitamin D. I think now it's, it's a standard routine to screen for vitamin D uh, and BBV. And if it's low, you give supplements, even if it's borderline, uh, give a low dose of uh, vitamin D. So I think there is enough evidence to recommend screening for vitamin D level, especially in those recurrent cases. In our clinic, we do it routine for, for all the cases. Uh, and if it's uh, uh, low level, we give supplements according to the level. Uh, even if it's a borderline, we add a low dose of uh, vitamin D. But regarding the lifestyle modifications, uh, we have a little bit different approach. Uh, first of all, we instruct the patient don't lie on the affected site for one week. So this is routine in our practice. And uh, we have very good results by adding this. Uh, I know there is no enough evidence, but uh, absence of enough research uh, evidence, it doesn't mean it doesn't work. So uh, we use here our clinical expertise. So we do little restrictions and we found no harm. We, do, we never recommend any cooler because it causes muscle spasm and the pain and it's uh, completely not, com uh, and it causes a lot of discomfort. So we never use a neck cooler. Uh, we usually, if you have posterior canal, we ask the patient to uh, lie on uh, a little bit higher pillow if there is no uh, contraindication. And this is usually causes no harm to the patient, but it could uh, improve a little bit the uh, outcome. Uh, what is- hey, Professor, it's, it's, yes. a very good, it's a very good thing you point out here. Uh, I remember when I was in Boston, Professor Harold Shukner, he used it to say a, a, a sentence. And he used it to say that even I stop watch is right twice a day. So, uh, it's it's perfectly because uh, it, it's a kind of discussion to give or do not give. If you do not harm the patient, it's okay. I mean, if you give restrictions or or if you have an experience of not give restriction, remember that I stopped watching. It's right today. So if there's no evidence, it, it means you're. I would like to call, to call our, our patient, patients uh, who do Pilates exercise or yoga. That is important. You understand me? Yes, Professor. I have a little bit uh, low connection. I hope that you hear me. Uh, I agree, and I, I don't like... Uh, the concept is that is uh, any guidelines which recommend against uh, some of the instructions because uh, what is the harm which could happen? 
I know exactly for the cervical cooler that causes muscle spasm, but what is harm can happen if you ask the patient don't lie on the affected side. Uh, one more thing for the lateral canal, always I combine some sort of forced prolonged positioning maneuver and uh, the therapeutic maneuver. So always I ask the patient uh, to lie on the uh, healthy side. But in some exceptions, we like in the utricular side, uh, horizontal canal BBV, we, we sometimes we ask the patient to lie on the affected side and we'll explain this in one of the slides. Do you hear me? Uh, I have a little bit uh, low connection. Can you hear me? Yeah, we, we yeah. just heard you perfectly, Professor. Perfect, so we need to get uh, for it. So let's to go to for the next question. Uh, yes. Uh, 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 Professor uh, uh, Luigi Califano, our great friend, is attending, I think, uh, this lecture. I will cite a lot of his work, really. He did amazing work, and we are happy to have him a faculty in our vestibular uh, room and to have him active member in our Facebook group. So there is a question, what is the possibility of abogeotropic posterior canal BBV? And for this, I, I cited or I quoted some uh, work of uh, my dear friend, uh, Professor Luigi Califano, uh, Califano from Italy. I think this is one of the earliest papers on abogeotropic posterior uh, canal BBV, and I highly recommend it. Uh, in this paper, he explained very nicely. Only one point, uh, it confused me before when he described, and this is how to differentiate uh, like abogeotropic posterior canal BBV from anterior canal BBV. So uh, it's, it depends on the torsional component. If it's pitting on the same side, so this is most likely uh, 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 like uh, in the right canal, in this paper, he wrote clockwise and the anticlockwise. Uh, this is uh, actually from the examiner perspective. And uh, uh, I will give the mic to Professor uh, Luigo Califano to comment himself because that's little bit, can be a little bit confusing. So if clockwise for the right canal, if it's if from examiner perspective, uh, it will be like uh, lift beating for uh, the patient, from the patient perspective. So uh, the difference between abogeotropic posterior canal and the anterior canal is in the torsional component. So if you have a right anterior canal uh, if you have a right uh, posterior canal, abogeotropic uh, nystagmus, from the patient perspective, uh, it will be beating uh, toward this, the opposite side. It will be beating toward this torsional component toward this, the left. And if you have a left abogeotropic uh, uh, posterior canal BBV, the torsional component will be toward this, the right side. So, uh, and we will give the mic for Professor uh, Califano to comment himself. So he reported that 2.5% cases of abogeotropic posterior canal and 11 uh, and 1.2 cases of anterior canal BBV diagnosed using the specific oculomotor patterns described in the literature. And uh, they, they did a very nice uh, uh, addition to the literature, they proposed a grading system for diagnosis of anterior canal and the abogeotropic posterior canal BBV. So they used the certain abogeotropic posterior canal when a canal are convergent <laughs> and a canal are convergent uh, in ipsilateral typical posterior canal BBV is obtained. So when uh, the abogeotropic <laughs> Please uh, mute your mic, please. Uh, mute your mic, please. So uh, it's certain when a canal are convergent. Yeah, but I mean, but I need to do it. I have to do it myself. Okay. 
So here, Professor Luigo uh, Califano, I want to hear from you. Yes. Uh, you have the mic now, uh, Professor. Uh, Professor uh, Califano, please are, comment. You are hearing? Yes. You yes, are we hear me, Professor. Yes. Okay. And Good evening to everyone. You can start your video as well, please. Okay. Yes. Yes, I'm trying. Welcome online. Okay. I th welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mama. I think uh, I think a uh, posterior abogeotropic is uh, a tool uh, much more frequent than uh, anterior canal. It is probably the most important, the most important, the most important criterion. Yeah. Yes, uh, uh, nystagmus characteristics are also important uh, with torsional component is surely more frequent in apogeotropic posterior canal than in anterior canal. But uh, the, I think the, if uh, the direction, Professor, explain because what I understood from uh, in depth reviewing your paper that uh, it was from examiner perspective rather than yes. from uh, patient yes. perspective. Which made yes. some confusion for uh, yes. Now uh, in the in the last uh, in the last paper I changed. I used the the, the, the terms proposed by by Barani Society, and we uh, could say apogeotropic torsional component. That's um, in the uh, patient's uh, perspective. It's uh, surely more correct than our previous mode to uh, to, to speak about. The direction of the nystagmus. So, in abogeotropic yes. posterior canal from the right side. Yes. Right side, uh, we say uh, we see a, a clockwise. Uh, it, uh, uh, in our perspective, in our examiner's perspective, we say we see a uh, in right canal a torsional clockwise direction. That's to say an apogeotropic direction because it uh, beat uh, the stagus bit toward the, toward the front of the passion. But the it should be in, the torsional the component the typical, should, be to the, the should be to the right or the left, Professor. In right posterior no, canal abogeotropic yeah. and the right duxohol bite. Yes. The torsional component should be in right to the right. No, right to in, the in, in every in every position, right. Uh, the pike in the rose position and uh, also in the left dixal pike. It's not important. The one, one of the uh, the most important characteristic is that uh, nystagmus is evoked in more than one position. It is another big difference between uh, uh, abogeotropic and the typical posterior canal uh, BPPV. But anterior and canal process uh, anterior the canal, side, yeah. anterior both, canal uh, in, in my opinion, well. in my opinion, in uh, anterior canal pre, uh, in in rose position, in rose position is most usually the most strong, the strongest, the strongest nystagmus in is in rose in rose in a extension position. Can, can you explain really more about the rose? Anterior canal is very, is very, very, uh, very rare. Okay, professor. In, in central hanging position. Okay, it was a central and hanging position. Uh, you, anterior so, canal so, usually uh, head hanging, straight head hanging position. position. So hanging, central and hanging. Yes. Perfect. So, so while in uh, a posterior apogeotropic, we uh, could see nystagmus uh, in right, in left, and in central position, and some and often, not sometimes often, the uh, the, the affected side does not uh, is not uh, wo the, the does not correspond to the right to the to the to the side we are testing by the equal pike. Uh, sometimes, in other words, a right uh, apogeotropic posterior canal uh, could uh, uh, provoke a, a more intense nystagmus on the, uh, for example, in the left dixal pike position. 
sometimes we uh, we could observe this type of pattern in the stagnants. Perfect, Professor. And I think uh, you will be teaching this uh, class in the diploma. So I think you will, will learn a lot from uh, uh, your experience in this. I, I hear show also. Yes, I think it's, it's more, it, it is probably simplest to see videos than to hear words in this case. Uh, I always try to converse in a typical form. This is uh, the only case in which we are sure we are, sure we are uh, speaking, about, we are talking about a peripheral uh, downbeating Nystagmus syndrome. In, in the other case, we could think this, but we are not sure of this. Okay, Professor. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a very interesting and you did a great uh, work. So uh, 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 Dr. Renato also in his presentation mentioned uh, that is if you have a down peating in the uh, fourth step of Ibli maneuver, that's a very good sign uh, that you did a successful maneuver. I little uh, uh, not in a complete agreement because I do believe Whenever you have the autoconia in the uh, common cross, you can either have a down beating or up beating, depending on the location of the autoconia in the common cross. So in common cross, it can work in the posterior canal and it can affect also the anterior canal. But which one is getting affected more? Sometimes from my clinical experience, uh, I don't know. Uh, and uh, and but it's very clear when it equally affects its pose, you have a, a predominantly torsional nystagmus. If the autoconia it came to the uh, common cross, or it's initially or basically present in the common cross, the I observe and I have a lot of cases from this. I have a, a, a torsional, um, a very clear torsional component and less clear or sometimes absent, uh, absent to vertical uh, component. And uh, 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 sometimes like in this paper, uh, which I am putting here as the name of the author, and let's to go to, they have some, uh, yes. If you see this, uh, this, is, this is a nice uh, really article. And I do recommend it because they explain that sometimes after we, de we do the Ibley maneuver and we, de we do a repositioning, some of the autoconia reflux back into the canal. And this reflux back causes uh, some sort of similar to the abodeotropic posterior canal baby. That's why you have a down beating in nystagmus. But this is when it, it just uh, reflux in uh, the opposite direction. Not all the autoconia, they moved successfully to the utricle, but some of them return back. And this is, could be one of the explanations why we do residual symptoms. Uh, residual symptoms uh, can be because of unsuccessful maneuver, can, see, uh, can occur because some of the autoconia, uh, they just reflux it back from the utricle into to the common cross or into the non ambulary uh, part of uh, the posterior canal. Professor uh, Luigo Califano, uh, have you have seen this in the practice? You did a successful repositioning or uh, repositioning for posterior canal. Then in the follow up, you find like some uh, sort of abogeotropic posterior canal or no? Yes, it's very frequent if you, see, if you observe uh, the patient uh, um, in a sh very short time. Uh, if you observe a patient in two or three days, uh, you always see this aspect. But if you observe the patient after seven or 10 days, it's, uh, you seldom observe this. Um, I agree with the, an incomplete liberation of the canal and the persistence of a bit of autoconia near the common cruise, probably. I don't consider, however, this form as a real uh, apogeotropic posterior canal, but a, a sort of a transient phase uh, towards the, the, the complete liberation. 
Okay, professor. This is, I think, it's 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 good to understand this uh, because that helps to understand the abogeotropic and the geotropic uh, posterior canal. So I'm here sharing a, a, a recent and very nice article. Uh, uh, I think came from Australia. So uh, this article shows like the different patterns of nystagmus in uh, different BBB types. So. As you see here, this is a typical posterior canal uh, nystagmus up eating and torsional towards the side. So if you have a right posterior canal BBB, the torsional component is beating to the right. Remember uh, this. Okay, and here is the typical component of uh, 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 of left cubule lithiasis posterior canal. So you can see that is the nystagmus is a little prolonged, but it's the same uh, like uh, 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 left beating, uh, le up beating uh, with torsional towards the left, but with a more prolonged duration. So this is the uh, cubule lithiasis. Uh, And here is uh, the nystagmus in the right anterior uh, canal BBV. So uh, 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 anterior canal BBV, uh, if you remember LARP and RALP, so the anterior canal, the uh, best position to, to show the BBV is the left dexual bike. Remember this. So in the left dexual bike, uh, or the plane of the left posterior canal, it is the best plane to test the BBV for the right anterior canal. So as you see here in this uh, diagram, that is in the uh, left anterior canal BBV, you will have uh, in the left, uh, in the left dexual bite, you have a right beating, uh, down, uh, down beating with torsion to the right BBV. Uh, nystagmus, uh, down beating with torsion to the right. In the left dexual pike, this is how the anterior canal from the right side, anterior canal BBV show uh, uh, in examination. So just to remember that is the right anterior canal show best in the left dexual pike because of the planar orientation of the semicircular canal. So, uh, yes, so this is the right anterior canal, then. Yes, I think this is also, it shows just the uh, uh, cobulocysis, and it shows very well the <coughs> utricular side uh, autoconia, which has been explained and uh, uh, shown by uh, our guest speaker. So it do exist, it's rare, but it do exist. And when it happened for the lateral canal, uh, it shows a specific uh, pattern. If you read the new paper coming from Professor Zoma and his colleague and uh, Dr. Ramos and uh, Renato Kell, they uh, proposed the three patterns so you can know in the horizontal canal BBV, where is the autoconia? It is in the short arm, it is in the long arm, or it is in the utricular uh, side. Uh, this is the geotropic uh, BBV, it's very clear. Abogeotropic nystagmus, you can see, and it's, uh, uh, it's, it's commonly to see one side which provokes more uh, the resistant nystagmus or more belonging, and one side uh, produces a, a transient and weaker nystagmus. So usually, uh, typically, the uh, uh, la, uh, turning the head towards the healthy side uh, gives the less nystagmus uh, because it's inhibitory uh, in the subineural test. But turning the head towards the uh, uh, towards the healthy side provokes more nystagmus in cases of abogeotropic uh, uh, horizontal canal. So uh, uh, we have a question here. Is it possible to have cubulolysis from utricular side if uh, how we can diagnose accurately? I think the answer is yes. And how it's, uh, 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 professors, do you have any experience with 
posterior canal utricular side uh, BBV. Have any one of you uh, diagnosed a case of utricular side posterior canal BBV? Um, yes, usually when the when the autoconias are in this short term, the utricular part of the posterior canal, uh, they are not attached in the cupola. Sometimes when you do the dig part, the particles just move back to the utricle. When it does attach, you may have a persistent downbeating with torsional component. And sometimes you have to use the vibrator. Uh, it's, uh, I, I remember, I, I believe I had one case, and it's not a big experience, but I, I believe it's true. I mean, you can have that. It's a possibility. And here, this is a paper from uh, Ramos and Kel and uh, Professor Zuma. I recommend, I recommend this recent paper, which uh, nicely explained the uh, different possibilities of horizontal canal uh, PPP. Uh, now let's to come the question uh, about the heavy and the light copula. Uh, I think this is one of the differential diagnosis of BBB, especially on the horizontal canal BBB. So in 1911, uh, uh, Robert Barani described the direction changing characteristic of positional alcohol nystagmus in humans uh, with the changes in the hip position. The specific gravity of alcohol is less than that of the endolymph. And when alcohol uh, blood levels approach 40 milligrams per deciliter, alcohol diffuses into the copula via its adjacent vascular supply. That's why I put the slide at the beginning. This makes the copula lighter than the endolymph, transforming the semicircular canals into receptors that are sensitive to the gravity. And in 1955, uh, Goldberg and uh, Laurel they stated that positional alcohol nystagmus appearing in two phases has been described with a special reference to the relationship between uh, positional alcoholic nystagmus and the blood alcohol level as low as 0.02. And I, I put this here, that is a very subtle changes in the plasma or in the blood density and consequently in the endolymph density or copula density, it could provoke some sort of uh, light copula or heavy copula. Even very low levels of alcohol can do this. And if you take the same analog, any changes in the blood, uh, which you can, uh, any changes in the blood, which you can it changes the density, even very subtly change, this is can uh, lead to uh, heavy copula or right copula. Uh, a nice work done by uh, XY Tang, Italian 2019, and they, they published uh, a paper, but uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the one thing which I don't, I disagree with them is that they put the duration of nystagmus is uh, to be less than uh, one minute. So uh, I do believe, uh, some of those uh, cases included it was just a typical uh, PBV maybe or something. So uh, uh, do you have experience, professors, about the light copula or heavy copula? I don't have experience, no more experience. Uh, one, I, 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 I saw one case about light copula with patient my vestibular migraine, just the one case. Uh, Dr. Renato or Dr. Uh, Califano, have you, uh, do you have any experience with light or heavy copula? Uh, Always only in migraine patients or in male patients uh, near an acute phase of their disease. I think I might saw less than 10 cases, but always in migraine or in many Passion. That's perfect. Yeah, I, I, Renato. I have just I have just a few experience that I believe to be a light cupola because I found the new plane, but you know it's 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 always complicated and I, I'm not quite sure if it was really a light cupola or not. But um, yeah, something is going on in these patients, and in, in, most of them have migraine as well. I, I totally. I agree with you. I have few cases uh, yes, as well. Uh, we, uh, Yes. yes, I agree with, uh, excuse me, 
Yes, I agree with uh, with Renato. <laughs> Surely we are not sure that light uh, cupola really is. An inter a possible interpretation is light cupola, but I think important that uh, the two classes, migraine patients or many patients, express uh, uh, both express an an uh, evaluation in endolymph uh, uh, metabolism probably. <laughs> I, I fully agree. Some difference. I think it's easy to explain uh, why it's common in migraine. In our experience, we have seen few cases with migraine, and I have one case with macroglobinemia. So uh, that's why I, I put here, because that was uh, a, a family member of one of our colleagues, and how many times I tried the maneuver, we did MRI, it was free, and it finally it's figured out to have some sort of macroglobinemia. Uh, so this is what the explanation, I think they managed in some way and she cleared with some medical treatment. So uh, here I put for you some references and I put the different mechanisms which can cause uh, light cobula or heavy cobula. And a reduction in the blood flow to the inner ear may disturb the endolymph formation, leading to possible changes of a specific gravity during the production of endolymph, thus making it it's heavier, heavier in comparison to the cobbler. And it's known that migraine can compromise the blood flow to the inner ear. So this is, could be a mechanism. Inflammation or injuries that may occur in the inner ear may cause plasma with leukocytes in the endolymph to increase, creating denser endolymph. And um, like Meniere's disease or autoimmune inner ear disease, there is a more inflammatory cells in the inner ear including the vestibular uh, division. So those could also change the density of the endolymph. A hemorrhagic event may lead to blood plasma proteins to leak into the inner ear fluids, leading to breakage of the blood labyrinth barrier, which may increase the specific gravity of the endolymph. Light debris could be attached to the cobula, making the cobula light, although the light debris has not been identified yet. Several candidates have been proposed uh, so like free floating cells within the endolymph uh, degenerate and this will up to become lighter. Attached autolith particles expand and become lighter. One of the theories uh, about the light cobula or heavy cobula that is uh, sometimes if the debris become small and by note and they get this, this dispersed all over the endolymph so it changes the density of the endolymph and it can cause some sort of uh, uh, like uh, uh, light cobula uh, syndrome. And I would like to, to, to just explain to the audience that if you have, uh, because people will ask why only we see it more in horizontal canal brains. Uh, this is if it happened in all the canals, uh, it affects the three canals. So most likely what you see is a horizontal rotatory nystagmus because of the sum vector uh, summation uh, the vertical components from the anterior canal and the posterior canal will cancel each other. And the only the component from the horizontal canal with some torsional uh, component will remain. That's why most likely we see it in the horizontal canal plane. I have no experience. I didn't see any kind of light cobula or heavy cobula in the posterior or anterior canal. Uh, most of the cases we have seen it's in the horizontal canal plane. Do you agree, professors, that it's more common, the few cases you have seen it was in the horizontal canal plane or it was in other canal planes? Always totally in, agree. Yeah, totally always agree. in horizontal, always in horizontal. Yes, it could be horizontal, but it could be also the three semicircular canal got affected and uh, as the sum vector of nystagmus coming from the affection of the three semicircular canals gives this kind of uh, a horizontal rotatory in nystagmus. This is a uh, possibility. And here I share with you, this is quoted from the book uh, by Thomas Brandt, uh, 2003, uh, where it's, uh, uh, it's multi-sensory syndrome. That is, they propose that is pathological hyperviscosity of the blood may be associated with polycythemia, hypergamma globinemia, or uh, Waldenstrom macroglobinemia, depending on the degree of hyperviscosity. Episodic vertigo may occur. It is most often caused by venous obstruction in the peripheral labyrinths. Symptomatic improvement seen after blood viscosity is uh, reduced. Uh, 
so now let's to say uh, how we treat uh, light cobula or heavy cobula. Usually we try the maneuvers and they don't work, but fortunately it's a self-limiting uh, condition to always resolve uh, uh, within two weeks. Sometimes we add some vestibular suppressants and sometimes because uh, one of the ways how to differentiate light cobula, heavy cobula from geotropic or abogeotropic uh, horizontal canal BBV is the presence of null point. So null point is a little bit more specific towards the light cobula and the heavy cobula. So the patient, they sometimes can figure out their null point. It's always 15 to 20 degree towards the affected side. So always they can just sleep on uh, the plane of the null point. This is uh, make them not to feel dizzy while lying down. Habituation exercises was reported by some authors that it sometimes uh, could work. Uh, we'll take uh, two or three questions. Uh, then we'll let Dr. Renato to go through uh, some questions. You can work in this, Dr. Renato. I'll go to the chat. Uh, big three or uh, more uh, questions that uh, to be covered. Uh, for me, I'll just keep some uh, questions. After this slide, we uh, will just take the questions from the chat. Can we prevent the recurrence of BBV? And if yes, then how? We mentioned that that is uh, vitamin D supplements can decrease the recurrence. And ensuring that you have a successful maneuver which effectively cleared out the debris. So this is what can be done. Professors, uh, you want to add something? What measures uh, can improve the recurrence of PBB? <laughs> um. You know, I, I, I don't know how to prevent. I usually ask for the vitamin dose, you know, to make sure the vitamin D is okay. If it's in a good level, okay. If it's not, I try to replace the vitamin D. And I, I don't have any good evidence that it really works, but it's, it's not going to do any harm for the patients. And, you know, I don't have personal experience with children because my clinical practice are absolutely focused in adults. And... I usually, the third question is how many, how you manage, you know, BPPV patients and when they have severe vegetative symptoms. Usually I can tell you that I did have a few patients that really throw up in my office, but that there were just a few of cases. And when I know that the patient is a little bit sensitive, I ask them to took a maclazine or some medication before the maneuver, half an hour before. And when I deal with old patients or if patients with, they have back problems and it's hard to lay down, I ask my secretary to help me out a little bit. And we usually we manage it in the office and most part of the cases, I never had a patient that I say, well, I, I can't do the maneuver, never. I mean, I, sometimes I did the maneuver with a little bit more carefully way, but usually it works perfectly if you have some help. Uh, thank you, Dr. Renato. I wanted to add that is we have few cases uh, of BBV in children. Usually they are uh, post-traumatic. So uh, we have few cases in children like 10 years, 11 years, and uh, it, it's commonly if they have uh, like a dental procedure with a drill, they have uh, sometimes uh, a neurosurgery procedure or something, and sometimes with uh, sport trauma or uh, any heat trauma. And uh, about the question, how to manage BBV uh, if patient has severe vegetative symptoms? I'll give you some uh, hints which could be uh, of help. Uh, cooling the room decreases the nausea and the vomiting. So cooling the room, make the EC cold and fresh air. So we, we, I have read this and I have been using uh, for years. Uh, they do help and uh, 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 and of course, sometimes if, if too much vomiting, uh, sometimes uh, we postpone the maneuver and just we give some uh, vestibular sedatives before the uh, next session. But uh, in the last two years, always uh, during the vestibular testing, we uh, cool the room, sometimes 18 degree or something, or uh, allow fresh uh, air if the patient feels nauseated. How to manage maneuver in old age patients? You have to be gentle and to have to be uh, cautious 
and sometimes no need to overextend the head, especially in elderly with osteoporosis and uh, fragile patients. Just be very gentle, uh, but um, uh, we, we can do successful canalis repositioning without overextension of the head. We sometimes uh, use a modified canalis repositioning maneuver and instead of extending the head of the patient out of the bed, we just put a pillow below the shoulders. So we do all the job on the bed. That uh, ensures that you don't do overextension uh, of the patient. I don't have a repositioning chair. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, our uh, other guest speakers, anyone of you has uh, like TRV or Omnix or any kind of repositioning chair or no? I, I do agree with my colleagues, it's the same protocol. And I'm saving money to try to buy this, uh, the TRV chair. <laughs> okay. Because it's very expensive to us. I, I don't have the chair, but I have given a try for, for the TRV chair and also for a different chair in, for a Swiss company. Uh, if, for those who have Facebook, you can look for my Facebook. I have the videos that I'm trying the chair. It's, it's amazing, but the price is absolutely unbelievable. So I, I, unfortunately, I, I cannot afford for it. Uh, same here. It's, it's expensive and even as we cannot afford. We have, and this is the last question I will take from my presentation to allow some questions from the uh, audience today. That is uh, about the, 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 the colleague asked about BBV and spinal cord injury. So I think it should be like with cervical spine or a spine injury or a spine problem rather than a spinal cord. Because if you have a spinal cord injury, that's always very serious condition. Uh, and it should be a priority to, uh, to keep safe the spinal cord. So just we will give some hints if you have a patient uh, uh, with cervical injury, with cervical instability, uh, Dixwell bike maneuver should be contraindicated. And the, most of the time, those patients, they have a cervical stabilizing not, uh, neck collar, not, not the soft one. It's a special one which stabilizes the cervical spine. And uh, 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 we, we will listen to our guest speakers, but uh, we don't examine a patient with cervical instability at all. So uh, what about you, professors? I, I believe I'm a lucky guy and I don't have this kind of patience. Thanks God for that. But to be honest, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I probably will not give a try for this help I test in a patient with kind of spondylitis cervical one. So I don't know, the good ones because I don't have this patient so far. Uh, okay, thank you. So uh, they are definitely, they come in a major accidents and uh, usually they have more priority than any kind of vertigo or BBV. Always if they uh, complain about vertigo, they just uh, give uh, some vestibular suppressants, but nobody will do a consultation for a serious uh, cervical spine injury or a, uh, uh, spinal cord injury um, uh, with, a, with a instability or with a serious spinal cord injury. Uh, so that's why we didn't see them. But definitely we see a lot of patients with cervical spindulosis, mild disc prolapse. And in those patients, what we do, we just we do gentle maneuver uh, and uh, we avoid the overextension of the head. So this is one thing we do. And as I mentioned before, we use the modified canal repositioning. We just, we don't extend the head beyond uh, the bed but we put a pillow below the shoulder and we do all the maneuver on the bed just to guarantee that we don't do overextension uh, 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 to the head. Uh, about side lying uh, or cement diagnostic maneuver versus Dixwell bike maneuver. So professors, what is your preferred examination uh, position for posterior canal BBB? Uh, I usually I like to do the Dix Help Pike test. I think that works perfectly. Um, I just give for a few cases that I try the sideline of test, but I, I feel much more confident with the, the regular Dix Help Pike test. Uh, okay, so any other comments from our speakers? 
No comments to me. Perfect, perfect. Just, yes, uh, just, yes. Uh, yes. Can, okay. Uh, um, I prefer uh, Simon Manover, therapeutic manoeuvre, in case of uh, spinal pro cervical problems, because uh, Simon Manovers seems to be violent, excuse me this term, but uh, really we do not use patient's neck in Simon Manover. The neck is fixed. We only have to translate to, to transport the body, all the body of the patients from one side to the other side. The neck is still. Yes, we so can do up. everything in this uh, maneuver. So, uh, 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 about the uh, whole body rotation using the uh, representing a chair, because many of our colleagues who are uh, having this uh, kind of systems, they reported they have a better results. Uh, so, uh, and there is a strong promotion for those uh, systems, especially uh, those who have some kinetic energy or something. So uh, I, I would love to uh, hear your opinion, professors, about the need to have, uh, or if it's a privilege or advantage to have a repositioning chair. And I'm sure that is in the future, we will have affordable ones. Yeah, I, I hope one day we may have affordable one. Uh, the one I mentioned the, from the Swiss company, it's um, it's absolutely mechanical. It's not automatic it's one, less, so it's um, it's a little bit you know less expensive. But at the time was fifty thousand euros, which is too much. But I hope that one day we can have some affordable ones. Uh, it, 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 it's a privilege to have one, I believe. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, by this, I will finish my presentation. And let's see to pick a few questions, uh, Dr. Renato, from the chat. I will manage this feedback and up. tell you. This way. Tell you fix. Uh, this way, one minute. Can you pick uh, one or two questions from the chat until I handle this uh, noise? Yes. Uh, I believe we have many issues here. Uh, I don't know. We can. Uh, I, I can. I can. I can put my email there if you, someone wants to contact me through email. It's perfectly fine. Um, let me check if there's any questions here. Um, so let's let's to summarize. Uh, we have, I got some questions. So we have a question about the residual dizziness following successful reposition. Can you comment on this, Dr. Renato? Yeah, residual dizziness, it's unfortunately, it's very common in my practice. I do have patients who have that. And we know that many of these patients, they have some kind of psychological issues as well, because I mean, I deal with a lot of patients with anxiety, chronic anxiety, and a lot of 3PD patients, which also have BPPV. And these chronic residual symptoms, it's, uh, it's very common. I usually recommend the patients to move themselves to be like trying to keep their normal lives and doing the normal activities. And some of them, it, they improve. Some of them think it's a little while to improve, but I do not prescribe medications for that. So usually the options for calcium channel blockers or beta histine or no, I, I, I usually don't prescribe these medications for patients. I recommend that to move, right? But it's, it's, it's common. Uh, that's great. I have, uh, uh, there is, you know, some controversy. I listened, uh, just read uh, one Korean paper. They recommended the medical therapy for the residual symptoms in BBB. 
Then I uh, listened to a lecture by a friend from UK, Dr. Professor Somit. He do a vestibular rehabilitation therapy, uh, a specific post BBV vestibular rehabilitation therapy for the residual uh, symptoms. In our practice, the first thing we do, we look for uh, a reflux of autoconia, any evidence, or a residual autoconia. So we re-examine the patients. We don't have, and if we find like some, there is some uh, nystagmus, even uh, uh, weak nystagmus or something, we just repeat the positioning. And because we, in most of our patients, we give them instructions not to sleep on the affected side. We have less uh, common the residual symptoms. We don't see it uh, much, but there is some controversy. Some Korean people, they published a controlled study and they said, just to give medications. Uh, British experts, they say, no, this is because of maladaptation, just to do a post PPV uh, customized the vestibular rehabilitation therapy. So uh, in our experience, we have much less uh, frequent residual symptoms because we are conservative. We give some uh, safe, non-harmful post maneuver instructions. And we instruct the patient not to uh, lie on the fitness side for at least seven or uh, 10 days. I have a question uh, here that is PPV sometimes is commonly associated with uh, with other conditions like Meniere's disease uh, uh, or other uh, conditions. Yes, that's uh, that's uh, true. I like to classify BBV into like primary without uh, a clear cause. Uh, maybe some risk factors, age, osteoporosis, uh, migraine, all this one, uh, uh, vitamin D deficiency or something. Uh, then secondary BBV. And secondary here is mean secondary, to a disease, a disease which has influence in the inner ear. So it can be secondary to a Meniere's disease, autoimmune, sudden sensory neural hearing loss, uh, autosclerosis after ear surgery. So those, I like to uh, call them uh, secondary BDV. Uh, then we have the post-traumatic. And uh, post-traumatic has a very clear definition that is the symptoms uh, should uh, appear within three days post head trauma. So, and that's when it should be labeled as post traumatic BBV. Uh, and in our experience, there is uh, uh, maybe in the post traumatic uh, cases, sometimes we have a more complex forms of BBV, like multiple canal or bilateral uh, BBV. Uh, maybe they have a little bit more, um, they need more sessions or um, uh, less favorable outcome from uh, the initial repositioning. Uh, but finally, they do clear. So uh, our professors, uh, what's your experience about more complex forms of BBV? And if uh, ma ma diagnosis or management of uh, like secondary BBV uh, is different from uh, diagnosis and the management of PBV uh, with a primary type, like without uh, any inner ear uh, disorder. Um, do you remember my first slide from Professor Nicholas Perry's quotation that I see? You know, these is patients, these patients is the BPPV ones, but the most difficult ones are also BPPV. So it's, it's challenge. Sometimes you have, you know, what you call secondary BPPV patients who have many ear disease or other conditions who also comes with BPPV. Sometimes migraineurs, a lot of migraine related dizziness, sometimes they present with BPPV as well. And, and I really believe that if you are dealing with two, two different conditions, you have, to, you, you have to try to control both. So I believe you need to control, you know, the 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 the, the, the base condition like the mini airs or migraine or whatever. But if you you always have tried to reposition in the BPPV because if you at least keep your BPPV under control, you improve the other one. Um, I I personally like BPPV patients because I see a lot and and I I really like to deal with that. But sometimes it's hard, especially in this profile that you mentioned. And I don't know how things work in, 
you know, in Middle East, but for example, here in Brazil, we have a lot of, um, you know, anxiety problems in elderly. And I, I need to deal with a lot of psychological issues. I, it's very common sometimes you treat a PPPV, the patient it's okay, they're not having these diagnosis anymore, but they still complain. And when you go through the, the history, you just notice that the patient is depressed, it's, it's under a lot of stress. So uh, there's no easy answer for that. Thank you. I will take two more questions and we'll uh, close our uh, session. So the free, first question is about the heat shaking uh, as a maneuver for the horizontal canal and the heat shaking as uh, a pretreatment uh, for BBV just to uh, detach the autoconia uh, and make it uh, more movable. So this is maybe help in resistant cases. So I would like to hear from you, then I will share my experience as well. Uh, yeah, sometimes uh, I use the head shaking test to try to get a better result. For example, uh, a patient who the history sounds like BPV and I didn't find anything in the positional test, I do some head shaking and try again. And I, I think that's a kind of tool that you can use to try to make it a little bit more sensitive for you know, evoked in the stands. But, but what, in which plane you do heat shaking, horizontal? Or you do it in the plane you suspect it has a BBV, like you do a vertical no, no, do. canal, just to, just to do a horizontal uh, shaking. I just, I just do horizontal, I just do horizontal, and not for so, so much as I do head shaking when I'm trying to see some kind of vestibular symmetry. I do for 20 seconds, but usually for PPPV, I don't do that so much. I did a little bit trying to move the crystal right. around. And, uh, and what about the head shaking maneuver for horizontal canal? You, you or Professor Zuma mentioned in your presentation, do you use frequently or not? Uh, no, I don't use frequently. I do not have a lot of experience with the head shaking maneuver during the, the, the reposition once. I, I never tried that. I tried sometimes before, the positional try, the positional test, trying to move the autoconias around. I don't do. I did uh, one twice. I had, I have very bad experience uh, because. It yeah, worked. I believe that. I believe, I believe when you do the head shake, you just spread yeah, the crystal yeah. around. It so. wasn't effective, it, and sometimes yeah. it converted the geotropic into abogeotropic. It's unsafe in yeah. elderly uh, patients. It's unsafe and. Uh, I do believe that it's a forced prolonged positioning maneuver, which is very peaceful, very safe maneuver is much more than effective. That's why if you go to any guidelines, uh, which is talking about the horizontal canal BBV, always forced prolonged positioning maneuver is put. It has some evidence and it's very safe maneuver. So always, if I have elderly or I have those fragile or I have those with too much vegetative symptoms, I, I don't uh, know. Uh, some groups, they are enthusiastic to it, but we honestly just share our experience. It's at unsafe in elderly people, and it, for it to work, it should be vigorous. Uh, enough rationale, there is no. Uh, so I prefer that you just do the force it, but don't get positioning one over. Sometimes just to ask the patient, lie on right or lie on left. In more than 80%, is the symptoms clear, safely and peacefully without any problem. The last question we'll take, because I see a lot of uh, questions, we might uh, do something about them, but the last question we'll discuss is what kind of investigation, when you do investigate for a case of BBV, when you do a video head impulse, you do VIMP or uh, like MRI or something. So when you investigate for BBV and what kind of investigation? So this is, will be okay. the last question. I, you know, when I see a BBV, case and it sounds like BPV and it's very typical. The nystagmus makes sense, the reasonable symptoms and the, you know, you perform the repositional maneuver and it seems fine. I do not do a, a further workup test in normal ones. But sometimes when the things are not making sense, you, you are seeing, you know, an expected kind of eye movements or the patient having kind of symptoms that leads me on to think about a central pathology, I investigate, and if I believe it's a central case, I ask for an MRI 
or if I believe that the patient have any kind of other vestibular um, problems, I investigate with VAMP or VHEAT. But usually the normal VPPB is I do not do further investigations. I only save the further investigations for cases that are not making sense somehow. I fully agree with you. Majority of PPV cases, uh, they don't need the investigation. The only thing is just examination with uh, video Google. This is mandatory and it will make a huge difference. You will pick more cases, more finding. And usually we start by looking for a spontaneous nystagmus. This evoked nystagmus. If you want to do the heat pitch test, that is fine because that's easy. One of the question or uh, you put in a slide that is the ENT clinics, they don't have a pit. So with the heat pitch maneuver, you can do. And we get some consultations where as the patient um, uh, on a chair, for some reason, they cannot go to the bed. We uh, do some modification and we do dexal bike or a modified dexal bike while the patient on the chair. With a chair. We ask him to move to the edge, uh, front edge of the chair, and we put some pillow in some way, and we, we can do some uh, uh, tilt to the head and extension. So sometimes the situation or the patient, sometimes he has a paraplegia, he has a catheter, and very complicated condition. So we, ha we see sometimes those cases. We do even the Dixwell bike on the wheelchair. And for the lateral canal, you don't uh, need, you can just use the head pitch test. And uh, bowing the head or head pitch, it's equal to turning head to, uh, turning the head to the affected side. Uh, you agree or know about this? I fully agree, Professor. Your point of view is absolutely perfect. So uh, tilting, uh, just uh, pitching the head or bowing the head in the front and bringing it back equal exactly to turning the head to uh, the affected side and toward this, the healthy side. So uh, uh, sometimes you can examine for a horizontal canal and you can diagnose successfully while the patient on the chair. So it's not a much excuse that if you are in ET and you don't have a bed, usually the ET chair can be extended. And uh, in one of the settings I work at, they don't have a special bed. So we have been using the ET chair uh, to be uh, for the examination. So always you can do something, but at least for yeah. the spontaneous nystagmus for the horizontal canal BBV, I think it's, uh, it, you can completely diagnose while the patient on the sitting position. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Zoma. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Renato Kal. We enjoyed your high quality presentation. You brought uh, great information and in great insight and the thanking, uh, thanks for teaching us the correct Zuma maneuver. As I mentioned to you, I tried from the paper or the animation. It wasn't exactly in some positions. I was doing something wrong. That's why I decided not to do any more unless I learn from the inventor of the maneuver. And then now it's very clear for me and very easy. So I think we will be doing more uh, Zoma maneuver for the geotropic and abogeotropic, and we'll be happy to share our feedback uh, with you. I congratulate uh, both of you for uh, the great research and uh, the great publications and the great contribution to the vestibular medicine and uh, science field. Uh, you are doing a great job, and uh, I have read your book about the updates in neurotology. It's a very good book. I read most of all your publications. I have all of them and uh, they are uh, excellent and uh, they have a new input and uh, uh, additions uh, to the literature. We, it was an Professor, honor. Uh, yes. I am the one who thank you for this kind of invitation. It you know, make us very happy and proud of being here. You know, we, we do not teach anyone. We are all, all the time we learn from now, all of us. So it's absolutely amazing to share uh, your experience, your Professor Califano experience, and a lot of other colleagues from the chats. Thank you very much. I really appreciate, and I hope we have another opportunity to be. Sure, you will you know. be uh, definitely uh, with us in the vestibular diploma. It's our great uh, pleasure and honor uh, to have you. And I would like to hear also from uh, Professor Zuma. Is there or he left already?
I, I believe he had some internet connection. He sent okay. me a message through WhatsApp. It's, it's uh, fine. Just uh, please pass to him our uh, great thanks and appreciation for his work and uh, for his uh, nice participation in this uh, very successful webinar. I'm sure that everybody learned something and uh, got inspired in some way. And I would like to hear from uh, Professor Luigo Califano. I'm a big fan of his work. <laughs> So uh, <laughs> let's see to say something for our audience and we will close the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm proud to be with you always. Now I'm waiting for my soccer team match. Yeah, okay. very important. <laughs> <laughs> our prayers oh, for team we, will we, win. We already, we already won our championship, but our our match we have to we have always to see our match <laughs> thank best, you Arthur, best wishes. thank you carlo best ciao, wishes ciao. for your team and by yes. this uh, <laughs> we thank uh, all the audience we appreciate the long uh, webinar today we appreciate your feedback we'll try to look to the chats if we can make few questions uh, for the future uh, your presence is much appreciated and uh, P2 for more uh, activities. And thank you very much and uh, goodbye.